Bugünkü podcast uzu hamastan hem korumam ki en acayip uzu kere. Çünkü farmatı en başka çöp oladı bugün. Çünkü mehmollar uzan sonu kov. Bugün 4 de mehmon uzu var. 4 de skillden 9 alışı niyat kıtırıp overall 9 ogen kandidatlar uzanı bugün, ustazlar uzanı bugün mehmon ge çakırdı. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. So what do you need exactly to do getting from 8 to 9 or from 8.5 to 9? So what's the difference there? I think that that's the secret formula. That's the magic what a formula behind getting a 9, I think. like. And I think that's the best way to learn. When you create that atmosphere for it yourself, is, yeah. you force yourself to learn English. What do you think? What was the most important part in your preparation to improve your English? Until I found um, a very good teacher for writing, which was uh, ChatGPT. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I think this is more natural approach to learning a foreign language. There was one problem with me uh, when I was uh, preparing for IELTS after like I got an aid. After the nine, um, as you all know, I had uh, my third child at the same time. So I almost named her Miss IELTS. And IELTS has become like a part of my life. Uh, in a way, I was pretty much married to IELTS, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> Assalamu alaikum hamagi. Uh, edu podcast yana bir sonada sizlar bilan ko'rishib turganingizdan juda ham xursandmiz, juda ham mamnunmiz. Har doimgidek o'zi harakat qilamiz, qiziqarli mavzularni ko'tarib chiqishga, suhbat qiziqarli suhbatdoshlarni chaqirishga va mana shu bizni ko'rib tomosha qilib yurgan uh, insonlarga, kandidatlar o'ziga, ustozlar o'ziga maroqli bo'ladigan, qiziqarli bo'ladigan mavzularni ko'tarib chiqishga. Bugungi podcast o'zi uh, hammasidan ham ko'rmamchi eng ajoyib bo'lsa kerak, chunki formati ham boshqacha bo'ladi bugun, chunki mehmonlar o'zan soni ko'p. Bugun 4 ta mehmon o'zi bor. 4 ta mehmon o'zi kakras soni bo'yicha qaraydigan bo'lsak, ana IELTS dan 4 ta skill bo'ladi. O'sha 4 ta skill yaxshi niyat qilgan holda 4 ta skilldan 9 olishni niyat qilib turib, overall 9 olgan kandidatlar o'zani bugun, ustozlar o'zani bugun mehmonga chaqirdi, suhbat qilish uchun. Suhbat o'zi ingliz tilida bo'ladi. Shunga ayb buyurmaysizlar, boshlanishini men o'z betimda boshlab beraman. Undan oyog'iga hammas ingliz tilida bo'ladi. Bu xolasi hammaga qiziqarli, maroqli bo'ladigan umiddaman. So Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in our podcast. So today we have uh, our guests. So I'll start from this side, Miss Mamura, Mr. Johangir. Uh, he is our, let's say, of course, no, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Bezad and Mr. Muhammad Ali. Uh, and today we're gonna have a conversation. I mean, discussion. How? What do you call it? I mean, about uh, your own experiences usually, and try to give the insights to the students how to get the nine or how to improve their English. Your own experience, and most importantly, I think that will be interesting question to ask. That's gonna be what has been changed since the you got the nine. Let's say. Yeah. So that will be quite interesting uh, to hear about that. So today, uh, if you allow me, we're going to start from the Mr. Jahangir, because he is the one who actually recently got the nine overall from IELTS. And I guess hearing your story, how it's happened, so that will be quite interesting. So if you start. Uh, okay, so I'll take it from here. Uh, yeah, my name is Jahangir. Um, 20, 25 years old, if anybody is interested. Uh, uh, on uh, an unrelated note, just uh, right off the bat, just would like to say thank you, Akmaleka, for bringing all of us together. Uh, because I don't know uh, how I would have uh, otherwise uh, gotten in touch with all of you, especially you, Muhammad Ali. You know, it's always get, it difficult to get hold of you. Uh, I'm really happy to see all of you here. That's an honor. Um, uh, and also, one more thing, just thank you to, to my parents, to everybody's parents for raising all of us. It's, I think it's all be because of them that we're all here, you know, having this conversation and, uh, you know, getting those nights. So, uh, mom, dad, huge, huge thank you uh, for making all of this happen. Uh, yeah, so um, what, what should I start with? Well, actually, for the beginning, how many times you have taken the aisles to get the nine, for uh, example? Uh, yeah. Uh, the interesting story is that 
Um, I, I've taken it overall like six times, five times before I got um, I got my uh, my nine. Yeah, uh, the first was back in 2017. I I got uh, 7.5. Then I retook it after three months. It was again 7.5. Then after I think about two years in 2020, I uh, retook it once again. It was uh, eight. Uh, after that, I retook it again. I got a 7.5. Then after that, I took it again. It was an eight. And after an eight, I went uh, all the way up to the nine, to the desired nine. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's how it all happened. So 7.5, 7.5, 8, 7.5, 8, and 9. I see. But today, by the way, if Mr. Bezat and Muhammad, I'll ask you for your assistance and help because you've already been our podcast many times yeah, and you have yeah, more yeah, experience sure. if you help me out with the conversation. So you, do you have any questions for Johangir? Or? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so how did it feel, you know, to, to get that nine? What, what did, 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 like, for example, did you feel any different? Uh, so oh, and, and then plus you, I think you applied for an EOR. So were you expecting that? Yeah, so let me start with this. Uh, you, Begzadek, and you, Muhammad Ali, you've been, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, you before like you got a nine, you had been taking IELTS uh, continuously for several years, yeah? <laughs> it's like yeah, and five yeah, shots here already. And you were, like <laughs> yeah, you were dangerously close. You were all dangerously close to, to the nine. I think it was all about like the matter of luck, you know, getting uh, like the right questions, the right task ones, the right task twos. And uh, in my case, uh, yeah, it was surreal. It was surreal uh, if you ask me why. Uh, the reason is because I, I I had an eight before that, and you know I jumped to a nine, and th that's why it was surreal. I think that that that's one of the reasons why I was a little taken aback when I got my EOR uh, results. Uh, but when I was applying for EOR, I was sure that I uh, was going to um, that I was going to get a remark because. Um, I was I was actually following a lot of like IELTS channels and reading a lot of essays from different channels and I saw that other candidates, other uh, IELTS instructors uh, who, who, who were writing essays, uh, I felt like that my writing was uh, at their level and some of them had an eight and I felt like that I should definitely apply for, uh, for e uh, EOR and uh, I think the final... The, um, it was Alisher, actually, Mohamed Ali. It was Alisher who told me to apply for. He said, like, you, sh you, sh you must apply for EOR. You, you, you got to do it. And I did it after Alisher said it. I had doubts, but after, like, you know, going through all of those essays, uh, I felt like I should apply. And it's co it, it must change. Yeah. So it was surreal, like, yeah. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons because I had I had an eight before and it jumped, you yeah, know, to, to a nine. I think yeah. That was unheard of, I think, right? Oh, I, I feel, I, I'm not sure about Miss Yuldashiva. You had an 8.5, right? Yeah. For yeah. overall? Yeah, b before yeah. 9. Yeah. yeah. Two times. Yeah. Uh, it, it's my only claim to fame, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's I had an 8 and then jumped to a 9. So, yeah. I see. So, yeah. because of EOR, you got a, uh, your, which, oh, not so, yeah, the, the, uh, the first score uh, the, uh, before the EOR was 9, 9, 9, 7.5. Yeah, so and your writing was 7.5, right? Yes, yeah. they changed it to an 8. That's a good example of an EOR being, you know, useful. Useful. Yeah. Well, I guess if you're confident, we always tell that to the students, if you're confident that you can, uh, you might, you could get higher score, then you should apply it. But usually what we advise the students is to speak with your teacher. Like in your case, yes, Muhammad Ali is not your teacher, but he's a f your friend, he's an experienced person. So he, he's, with his advice, you decide to take EOR. Same advice to every other student. Speak with your teachers, because your teachers knows you better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Literally, some people, they keep asking me about, uh, uh, let's say, about the IELTS itself. So I'll give a kind of, let's say, how do you call it, uh, example. Like we like a kind of laboratory. So we check, we examine the people, and we just give them results. But we're not the doctors. So we can't give you diagnosis. Mm. Is it right? Yeah. yeah, right. yeah. yeah. So basically, right the teachers, now, you guys, the ones who know the students, who can tell them what kind of mistake they made or something like that. So advising with the teachers all the time about your scores, about your experience, about how well you performed in, in your exams, it's going to be uh, most important things before you apply to EOR, basically. But yes, EOR is basically for the people who doesn't know is literally it's uh, the 
the work you have done it like listening reading writing and speaking they will be checked once again from the beginning with going to the same process or same process but with different team members mm. so basically there will be another examiner who is going to check the mm. your work and going to check the examiners who actually give you the score yeah. so if there is a difference the senior examiner who has got the more experience uh, he's just going to have a look to the balls I mean uh, ratings and he's going to give his ruling about it basically mm -hmm. that's why it sometimes changes sometimes it doesn't change literally but there is a chance literally some of the people I think they know that the, the chance of increasing the your score to 0 0.5 it's it's high usually it's 50 50 but changing your score to 1 it's less likely change change in 1.5 it's very rare it's very difficult but it happens also oh. but this I mean as usually examiners doesn't do the big mistakes otherwise it's gonna have an effect on their job on their performance so that's why they're trying to do be as much as accurate as possible oh, yeah I see if I'm not mistaken if they make a mistake uh, they go through retraining yeah, yeah? definitely uh, there is a different process actually we, our internal process tells us what kind of mistake it was I mean basically they so based on the mistake they made they're gonna get mm. retrained or sus even they can be suspended literally Ooh. if they're gonna do the like a big mistake so that's why when the people says about the examiner didn't like me and put that kind of low score or examiner like me and put the high score it's less likely because otherwise if it's gonna be EOR it's risky it's, it's very risky, risky. Yeah. so See. they might lose their job anyway Ooh. literally so that's why examiners trying to be very very careful and accurate about their ratings yeah. but of course they're human beings of course they made mistakes but uh, so that's why EOR is exist literally yeah, yeah. so that's the problem <clears throat> I think it was uh, that Australian IDP ex examiner uh, on telegram he said that it might happens that uh, all uh, IELTS examiners go through standardization training uh, but we all sometimes just a little bit subjective or make mistakes like Definitely. everybody else and that's why you know, EOR like is there for that reason yeah okay do you yeah, have any questions? I, I got a lot of questions to ask of my friend. Well, <clears throat> first off, it's, it's it's an honor to be here again uh, with new team, completely different. Yeah, I see your Ms. Mamura and Mr. Jahangir, my old friend. So, uh, the, uh, so the question I'm dying to ask you is, so there was a part where you said, uh, when I got eight, I realized I had to go all in. So can you provide some backstory on that? Can you tell us more about what made you make that change? Um, yeah, I was um, not, not kind of scared a little bit. Um, I, I was expecting this question, you know. I was expecting that you're going to uh, bring, bring this up. up yeah. yeah, bring this up. And uh, it's a, a little bit, it might be a little bit emotional in a way. Uh, so let me just, <clears throat> it's going to be quite a long journey. So a few minutes of your time. So uh, it all started about two years ago. Uh, if you remember Muhammad Ali, we were graduating at the time. Uh, and I think it happens with everybody uh, that as soon as you uh, graduate, you have all of these questions, what I'm going to do with my life, uh, what career path to embark on, and uh, what to do with life in general. And uh, I was one of those people, and, uh, and I, <laughs> you know, um, uh, everybody was against it, but I decided to change my career uh, completely. I, I thought like I need to make some changes uh, and uh, I was teaching at the time. Uh, if you remember, we were teaching at the direct school. Uh, it, uh, it was a great time. So what happened? I decided to change my career. I decided to do uh, forex training and it was it was such a hell because I did it for two years. I kept trying. And I failed miserably. I, I failed miserably. It was uh, the probably the worst, but very uh, learning period of my life. It was such a learning experience. I think we talked with, about it with you. Uh, yeah, I remember you trying to get me into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, teaching is, is you know, doesn't have future and stuff. I, I believe that, honestly. And for two years, uh, I've been trying my heart, like the, the, the hardest, yes, uh, to get out of this, but uh, eventually I failed. And it was, I think, around uh, May when I decided to get back to teaching. It was just May, about how many, like three, four months ago. Uh, it was very hard. So I was, uh, I came back to teaching and I had very little money and uh, I had 
you know how many students I had two students in in my first group just two students for the first month my first salary after getting back from trading to teaching was uh, two students, 700,000 sums. I was left with 700,000 sums. I had no idea what to do. It, uh, it was a very depressing uh, period of my life since uh, I honestly just had no idea. And uh, you said why I wanted to uh, go all in. Uh, the reason was like it was the only escape I had, which is to improve my English as much as I can, uh, get it to the nine, and use uh, use that you know to 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 gather audience, uh, to get the necessary following. And yeah, it was very hard. It was very hard because at the same time, I, I've been following you like uh, in, in a good way. I was, uh, you know, envying you because you you had like already so many people following you. You had uh, like you, Bigzotake, you, Muhammad Ali, you, you had following you, you. You were already big in the industry and uh, it hurt. Uh, it was difficult. Uh, at the same time, you know, one of another reason why I went all in was that my mom uh, she got diagnosed with uh, with a disease and it, it hit hit me really hard at the time. So I had no other choice, guys, but to uh, go all in, as you said, and uh, do my best. I took IELTS uh, with Bridge Council. Uh, I got an eight overall, but it was like 0 0.5 shy of shy of an 8.5. But I was very scared to apply for EOR because of the 700,000 sums I had in my pocket. <laughs> uh, yeah, and for the record, I had to borrow money for that. But don't borrow money to take else, please, <laughs> if possible, <laughs> if possible. Yeah, I borrowed money, uh, like a few thousand dollars, just you know, to take IELTS as many times as possible before I get to the nine. Uh, you act like actually you remember you said that I had uh, an exam coming up yeah remember yeah. and you yeah, said yeah. like you do want to like cancel it I canceled it well it was very emotional very hard time and um, uh, at times I, I decided that I need to be consistent and uh, keep trying uh, keep studying every day it was hard I got through it uh, yeah that's like kind of a, the, the, the back story what at all I think you can kind of capture your story with the quote quote I wrote in response to your results. I remember when the appeal results came out and I was one of the first people you texted and I left a quote there if you remember. Uh, and the, uh -huh. Yeah, and I think that quote, quote really hits the nail on the head and, and that quote goes, change happens when the pain of staying average exceeds the pain of change. Okay, I, and sounds I, a little bit difficult to understand. <laughs> yeah, but, but but if you think about it, it really puts everything in a nutshell. The story uh, I think, you got I here. think there's another quote that qu that applies to you. When you hit rock bottom, the only way to go is up. It was. It was. I, I, I think uh, we, we talked about this guy called uh, Chris Williamson, a uh, very big podcaster, uh, really interesting guy. Uh, I do recommend everybody to go and check like the podcast out. It's a really good one and. One of the things he said, when you are at the, this is at bottom, when you are at the bottom, whatever risk you take, uh, whatever mistake you make, nobody's going to see it, so just go for it. You have yeah. nothing to lose. Yeah, no, you have, I literally had nothing to lose apart from a few hundred dollars, and I was like, oh, let's, let's just go for it. And, you know, adding insult to injury, at the time I was applying for a few places to work in, I got rejected everywhere. So okay. everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> Literally everywhere. Okay, uh, you the need the teachers who got the nine. Please <laughs> contact no, 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 no. The first place, the first place to reject me actually was Internation. Uh, yeah, after that I applied for uh, in your place. Uh, uh, yeah, well, let's yeah. not name names. Yeah, yeah, but or, uh, yeah, because be I, I didn't have. Before he went to you, he came to us too. I remember you wanting to return. Yeah, so a big and uh, Muhammad Ali. Yeah, I applied for. So for you turned them down too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I had my reasons. Okay, okay. I, I don't want to sound like. Yeah, I think I I'm, told you. This yeah, this is an excuse, but. Uh, so I had nothing to go for me, guys. Uh, I don't think uh, it was internations or Muhammad Ali. So because like, as, like oh, you know, I, I'm not blaming you guys because uh, at the time I had nothing to offer. But because the first time I applied, I had an eight. Uh, before I applied there, I also had an eight. And plus, you said that you've already hired people, and you just you had just hired. And I, I mean, Mohammed Ali, my friend, I'm sure you w you wouldn't like otherwise decline my you know uh, decline me if you like just had an option. So yeah, adding you know fuel to the fire was also the fact that I got rejected. Oof. It, it was it was such a roller coaster of emotions. It's oof. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, re- I'm remembering it right now. It, it was hard, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was hard. Look, I, I didn't get an 8.5. I'm not, not really embarrassed. It's not. It's not about embarrassing. It's it's not an embarrassing situation. It's 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 about. I think. No, he when he came to us, I think he told me that he applied for a job at with Isle Zone maybe a couple of years ago. Was it like yeah, the first time? Yeah, like right after the lockdown. I, I don't think I was actually involved in that decision. No, I didn't not. even know him. Uh, but um, recently, when he applied, actually it was two or three weeks before his result came out. Yeah. So we had an interview. Um, I told him the reason why I was hesitant about, you know, um, plus he was working for the school and, um, you know, it would be, uh, you know, it's it's like, I don't want to get involved in the, like I, I told him to maybe, first of all, he needs to quit his job and then maybe come, but he was uh, reluctant. So that, that was one of the reasons, but yeah. Uh, English is not the same as English. I have to say that 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 I have I don't know what blessing in disguise. Yeah, yeah. Huh? blessing in disguise. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, so what I'm saying is, it was a blessing is, in disguise. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> you never Maybe. know. Yeah. You never know. It's all for the good. Yeah. 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 It's all for the good. Literally. It's all, it's all when you fail or when you feel like you're at the bottom. It, the difference is what you do with it, because if they rejected you, if if you couldn't get anywhere and like everything seems like it's all not working out for you, then what you decide to do will kind of make so that makes your nine that much more special yeah yeah and um yeah what well, I, I forgot what i wanted to say <laughs> <laughs> to cry. yeah no no, nah. no 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 it's i'm not i'm not it's just, all right yeah so um the 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 thing um all right why are we nah, I, yeah it? yeah let's uh, let's move on and uh, yeah let's move on to me. <laughs> talk talk to mamura miss yeah. mamura about basically, her experience yeah about your experience basically you know what will be interesting about it so the uh, coming back to the beginning where i started about it. so hearing what has been changed in your life literally in i mean in all of you literally yeah. it has been a while since you got the nine especially yeah. muhammad Alan and Begzad. and i know that mamura has got the, some of the She's engaged with the new project. I know you opened the uh, branches of the IELTS zone. Yeah. I know that uh, Muhammad Ali, they're getting a lot of students now, right? And they're expanding their business as well, kind of. So it will be quite good to hear this story. So what has happened now so far? Was it good, as we say, was it good to get the nine or it didn't make any differences, for example? Well, I'm definitely seeing my kids less. <laughs> <laughs> I miss spending time. I miss doing chores. I miss cooking. I miss baking. But this is all for the better, I think. Um, so after the nine, um, as you all know, I had uh, my third child at the same time. So, she, so I almost named her Miss Iles. <laughs> what, was was it on the same day or the next? No, the following. I, um, I took my test on the 18th of May. Okay. She was born okay. on the 21st, and I got so, my results on the 22nd. Oh, okay. So, wow. so it's the d- wow. double. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was told That's this. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I was like, holy <laughs> moly. <Sorry. laughs> like, yeah. But, th- you know, this is, it, what was more special to me was that there was nobody there for me to, like, scream at. <laughs> it was just ah. myself in my room with my baby, and <laughs> she was a sleeper, so I couldn't really, you know. But I te- started texting everybody. Start texting my parents, my husband, everybody, and said, I did it. I told you I would do it, and I did it. So it was really exciting for me. But since then, um, we've been working on, with, with our team, we're working on some, uh, doing some webinars. Um, and also, I'm still teaching at Result. My class is about to be over soon. But um, now we're going to focus on our own project. So hopefully that will be more beneficial to a lot more people than just a limited people who fit in a classroom so we'll see no i, I want to hear more about because it was all of a sudden right it was she basically her we we didn't know i didn't know your name i, I don't think anybody yeah, I came out of would, like, because you you were new <laughs> to the um ielts kind of uh, business yeah. all this funny business so um yeah so t- tell us more about like how you 
why why you decided to become an IELTS instructor? Well, I didn't. And when? when, <laughs> when I, I, I was yeah. kind of pushed into that direction. So what happened was we moved from United States just last July. So it's been over a year now. But I was teaching online. I was teaching um, finance, math, and some accounting to students in the United States. I still am. Mm-hmm. And so that was my main thing. That's That's my main, you know, thing. I, uh, right. Teaching, teaching was yeah. your main thing. So yeah. I have an MBA, so my f- main focus is just business. But we were we decided to move here, and I can like a nose. When we came here, I, I couldn't really teach what I wanted to teach because to teach finance in Uzbek is like a you know mountain for me. It's, it's, I can't, yeah, it's, you know, I can't, it's a whole I different ball. Yeah, it's yeah, a I don't different ball game. Uzbek, yeah. and I don't have enough Russian, zero Russian to teach in that language, but. My husband said, you know, you should look into IELTS. This was way back before we left, before we left United States. He said, you should look into IELTS because it's like the main thing right now in Uzbekistan. IELTS oh, obsession, IELTS. yeah. You know, why do I need IELTS? I speak English perfectly. I've been living here for so long, like almost more than half my life, so I don't need English. And he said, all right, but I'll tell you, you'll need it. So we came here, and um, this was in December. So July, and then in December, I decided to take IELTS because what changed was... Um, there was a lot of, like, we live right here, so there's this university and the learning centers, and everywhere you see the ads for IELTS, I said, that's such a big deal, you know, I didn't know it was such a big deal here, so I said, okay, let me just take it, and I was going through some um, health problems at the time, uh, so I said, you know what, I need to go and do something different, otherwise I'm just going to be stuck in this bed, so I said, why don't I go just go and take IELTS? So I signed up, and I came, no preparation, because I just wanted to see how I would do, just as I am. Yeah, just to see. So I hadn't spoken English to anybody in a long time <laughs> since I came here. So I was really, I really enjoyed talking to my examiner. We had a Zoom interview. So I was a little sick, but then I was like, oh my God, English speaking person. So I, I enjoyed talking and I remember leaving right before my, uh, the end of my exam. She said, this is the end of the exam. Thank you so much. I said, can we talk some more? <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'm sorry, we got to go. I got to have another examiner, another student. So I left and it was just like an eye-opening experience for me because I realized, you know, what can I do with this English? Like instead of just, you know, letting it go to waste and not using it, maybe I can do something with it to help because I'm, I don't have nothing to do anyway. I'm just sitting at home. So I applied to before I applied, I went to some learning centers around here. I'm not going to name ah, which Another ones. story of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Actually, yeah. Wait, we as don't have that. Okay. Not Actually, as a teacher. No, I, I, not as a teacher because I, I didn't know about teaching IELTS. I just thought maybe I can just teach English because everybody was into English and I can't teach IELTS because I've never, I don't have enough experience with IELTS. So why don't I just start with teaching English? So I went to some learning centers to see how they teach because... Two things, I don't have experience speaking Uzbek to students here to teach something, and two, I don't have experience teaching to like live classes, offline classes. I've been teaching online. So I wanted to get that experience, and first I wanted to see how the teachers do it here. So I went to some learning centers around here. I'm not going to name which ones, like five or six I went, including Internation. So you're listening. not naming places, but you're just naming one place. Just one place. <laughs> the reason why I named it is because they have some age restrictions, and I'm 35, I was 34 at the time, and they don't take students over a certain age uh, limit, so I was rejected as a student. <laughs> so I was really sad and said, well, they didn't take me. I just wanted to go and see how they would teach, and maybe I would take some classes for IELTS, because I actually, I seriously wanted to take some IELTS classes to you know, maybe improve my IELTS score. But um, yeah, it didn't work out. And when I went to those learning centers, I learned some things for myself. Um, what to do, what not to do when I teach English. So, and then my husband said, there's a learning center opening right downstairs. And it was uh, the, the one that I'm teaching right now, results. So we, I applied, I called and said, hi, I, have, you know, I just came from the United States. I have an eight aisles. They need the teacher. And they said, can you come downstairs right now? <laughs> <laughs> so I went down, we, we had a conversation and um, they hired me as a general English teacher. So that's how I got started with teaching English. But over time, I saw that there were other teachers at Results who were um, who had a higher IELTS score, and I said, you know what, that, it's great, but maybe I can try another time to take IELTS. And after some time, I think it was in um, first one was in December when I got eight, and then I tried again in I think March, beginning of March, and um, I didn't do a lot of studying because I was busy, you know, focusing on teaching English, 
it's, it's different when you have to teach English than when you speak English. You have to actually sit down and plan what you're going to teach. That one I got eight and a half. So I said, oh, okay, it's getting higher. Maybe I can try a little bit more. It's like, what's the high score anyway? Like, it's nine. All right, has anyone gotten nine before? At the time, I don't think you had your nine yet. So I don't know how, you know, I don't know the expectation for <laughs> people like who are from different countries who come and take it. So, you know, this is not enough for me. Like eight was not enough for me because even though I took it just for just to see how it, how I would do, um, it was almost embarrassing for me to to take eight. And I decided you know, I need to get higher just for myself, just to prove to myself that I can speak English well. <laughs> so I decided to take it another time, but this time I studied. But I got an eight, eight and a half, but some some of them were nine. I think I got listening nine and reading nine. I was no, yeah, one of them, two of them were nine. I said okay, so. This two got nine. If only I can fix these other two, maybe I can make that a nine too. It was, I think it was writing and speaking that had to make a higher score. So that's when I really got into this whole IELTS movement. And I said, you know what, I, I'm so close. My health was almost, you know, it was near my due date. I said, I got to do this right now. If I don't do it right now, I'm not going to do it after that because, you know, I'll be busy. I don't have, I won't have strength to prepare anymore. So I bugged my husband about this and said, you know what, pay for me please I need to take this one and he said no you don't need to eight and a half is good enough you need to rest focus on your health I said no I have to do it right now if I don't you know what's my daughter gonna think when she's older like, she only went this far but you know I said I have to do this so he said okay fine and then I prepared I knew it was my writing that I had to work on so I try to do some uh, watch some videos and learn how to how I can do improve how I can improve because I remember how I wrote before and I took it and my mom was with me at the time so I said mom I need you to come and pray for me <laughs> she took her book and she came she was sitting in IDP just you know but with the students and she was she started praying and reading her book Quran and I said inshallah I'm gonna get nine so I got blessings from all of my you know my moms my, my parents and him and I went in. It was an amazing feeling because this was, you know, once or never kind of yeah. moment. Like this all time or, or nothing, never. Yeah. You know what yeah. what we all of you have in common? So you all take the IELTS many times before you scored actually nine. So it will be quite interesting to get. So what do you need exactly to do getting from eight to nine or from 8.5 to nine? So what's the difference there? Do you feel it? I mean... Well, I think we talked about it um in in the last podcast when we had it with him um i think it's a matter of luck to a certain extent um because um like i said again last time everything has to go your way like it's it's like basically it's a lottery like um, it's not so much of a lottery i don't i don't want to undermine anyone's you know uh, uh, the, the the results but um I'm, I'm talking about myself here because I've t I think I've done the test more times than anybody else. And mainly because I didn't have anybody like me basically showing the way or paving the way or taking the test many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of, you know, I, I had to go uh, all the way just to see. Um, and I've been doing it for so many years now. And IELTS has become like a part of my life. Uh, in a way, I was pretty much married tiles, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and I recently got divorced, so <laughs> we'll see. So the point is, you just need the combinations, like combination of scores, right? So the um, closest I came, I think, was when I got my 8.5 for writing with you guys, ITP, and back in, uh, what, July? It was the second of July, it was, I don't know. So it was like, I got my 8.5 in writing, that, that was the beginning of an end maybe right so i came so close i could even like i, I could actually smell the band. I like <laughs> so now there's no backing down there's no going back but again i, I tell you what like if someone else had done it before me like maybe i wouldn't be that crazy about ielts so someone had to take the bullet i think and uh, you know yeah, I, I guess um, that that's the story that you know I want to share today. I guess, but uh, we'll see. We'll talk about. It. How about you, Mohammed? So, what do you think? Well, 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 I think what I think is the missing component here from the equation is 
probably consistency. Like what we all have in common here is we just kept doing it. And uh, it's, it's, it's really important that you have the right approach and you combine that with uh, consistent effort. And it's just a matter of time before it works out the way you want it to. So, yeah, it's such a big piece. Now, Adding to that, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, to a certain point, to a certain level, you compete with others. Like you have like a seven or an eight, and then you say, okay, I have this many people who are taking eight, I have to compete with them. But at some point, you start competing with yourself. Like how you did before, now you forget about everybody else. You forget about, in my case, I forgot about you and you. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do this for myself. It's not a competition because it's, I really did not do it to get a nine. I really did it to prove to myself that this is possible and to also show my daughters that, you know, don't give up. And, you know, whoever is interested in my story, you know, don't give up. It's like just a classic story. So at some point you become, you get into a competition with yourself and now you're only focused on how you can improve yourself. And you know your weak points. You can't really say it. You can't explain it. Like with my writing, I couldn't explain where I had mistakes, but I knew where my mistakes were. And I focused on those. So you find your points of weakness and you pinpoint them, you zoom in on that, you work on it day and night consistently, like you said, with determination. And then you go into the test day saying, this is what, this is the mistake that I'm not gonna do today. While keeping the other things. I, yeah, I, I, I think I agree with her on that. Like, I think that that's the secret formula. That's the magic what a formula behind getting a nine, I think. Like, because if you keep comparing yourself to others, it's like you, you keep, getting stuck on that whatever band score that you know you don't want to get uh this is like it i think it happened to me um two months prior to, to to getting that nine i stopped taking the test so many times i i wanted to take some breaks in between and then i wanted to reflect and i started pu pu putting down some work like doing some actual work instead of like just taking it and over basically and just again. yeah over and over and chasing my luck without doing any actual practical work because and then once you start okay thinking about your own strength and weaknesses like once you start embracing like um accepting that okay i'm probably i'm not good enough for this but if i could maybe practice writing or speaking or whatever for that matter and and then you it, you start seeing progress so and and i agree with him as well like it, it's it's all about consistency it's like once you start seeing consistency and then you start like okay so that's good close enough and like you have to again this is this goes out to everyone who's um maybe trying to get a nine you have to stop comparing yourself you, to others mm -hmm. like you have to do it for yourself that's that's all about the mindset because Two, three years ago, I think, um, I had all these things, you know, planned. Okay, so if I ever get this nine, I'm going to do this and that. Like, and then once my mindset changed, it's like, okay. And then I was actually psychologically ready for that, I guess. And I didn't do anything. Like, I got my score. I didn't do, because <clears throat> as you point out, there was a competition anyway. I think it was a competition that I may have started back in whatever year I, because I got into this IELTS thing uh, back in 2014 and I don't remember IELTS being this much of an obsession during that time yeah. nobody really cared about IELTS no one really you know it's like basically talking to native speakers like no one actually gave anything like they didn't care about IELTS right like you now talk to a, like an agency and say oh look, I got a nine on IELTS like so what is IELTS what what is that right so they don't care and nobody actually cared about IELTS I guess yeah. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm mistaken anyway so and then there so was this anyway it, it wasn't, wasn't that important. important no one no one was crazy Every, everyone was like there were in IELTS instructors probably with eight eight point five but they weren't after nine, I guess, right? And then plus, we already had rumors that there were niners, well, so-called niners. So that's one of the reasons why there was uh, no competition, I think. How about you? So what do you think about 
I, I'm on board uh, on that one uh, about luck with you, uh, because of the cap. Uh, the the point you made about luck, I think uh, after a certain point, it was about uh, in your case just chancing your luck uh, a lot because. Um, if you get uh, some, it just sometimes you don't get the right task one or don't you don't get the right task two or don't you don't get the questions you probably had prepared for sometimes uh, and yeah if you say like do you like need to be ready for all uh, uh, do you need to be ready for all of the questions yeah there is IELTS speaking assistant you can open it you can get prepared for all of the you know IELTS questions they are all there uh, I think it's about yeah it's a little bit about uh, luck as well as uh, consistency, consistency because everything, yeah. look I, I I had been preparing for IELTS I had been th- not preparing like uh, doing IELTS stuff like teaching and preparing for about three years before I took it in May uh, so, no five years but it was like on and off the stage on and off the stage and, and when I took it in May uh, I prepared in May then June then July yes when I got my results out so, so for three months it was like all of my efforts were like condensed into that little uh, little period of time and I really did my best to you know to improve it and about uh, the point that Miss Yuldashua made about um, uh, you said you had weak points and you needed to work on them. Th- there was one problem with me uh, when I was uh, preparing for IELTS after like I got an aid is that I uh, I got an aid in speaking but 6.5 in writing and I thought let, let's work on writing and forget about speaking it's good. Uh, what happened is that next time I took uh, IELTS I got a 7 in my speaking and I got a 7.5 in my writing and I was like yeah, that's the problem. Uh, the problem is that it's better if you got a nine in, in, in certain sections. You need to keep it at that. Try to work on that. Keep working on that. Yeah, probably not as hard as, for example, on the writing part that you want to improve. Uh, but you shouldn't definitely forget about the other parts because uh, you might run the risk of, you know, all just lowering your scores in those sections. So I agree on the point about consistency, about luck, and about working on those weak areas, but you shouldn't forget about um, uh, the, the strong areas as well. I think there was this theory about, maybe you, Mohamed Ali, heard about survivorship ba- bias, bias, about playing, yeah. yeah, getting shot a few times, and they started to improve uh, the parts that were shot, yeah, and uh, eventually, uh, they just Im- they, they just made uh, the strong part stronger, but the weak parts, you know, what were left there. So uh, I guess that's the point, yeah. I don't know in English, but I can tell you in Russian. So what's it called? The systematic ошибка выжившего называется. Теория. English is a little bit more. Survivorship bias. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's probably, what I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah probably. So it's, it's actually about, it's this theory used in the statistics about finding out the best solution or analysis about data analysis kind of thing. But it's an interesting things. We had a conversation, I mean, about this in our previous uh, not previous one, but, I mean previous, previous podcast. So it's quite interesting things to learn about, actually. So, so you tell us about your preparation. So what was actually, what kind of materials, what's importantly, or what do you think, what was the most important part in your preparation to improve your English? So probably everyone says books, audio files. Yeah, yeah, yeah anyways, okay. So everyone has got. I'm not sure if I talked about it before, um, but the um, I was doing these writing marathons, right? So uh, I think I, I mentioned that um, I had a second. Like I had a when I say second, that's like in sports, in boxing, or in chess. You had a second, like meaning. Uh, more of a uh, some, someone who uh, who can help you with your work, right? In this case, in my case, it was writing. So I was doing a writing marathon, and um, this uh, colleague of mine, Eldor, uh, was there to help me with my writing because he's really good at, you know, judging someone's work. So he was giving me this harsh feedback. Uh, again, it, it, all, it all, I think, came from uh, seeing these two guys working together, uh, Mohammed Ali and Anishir, all the time, and I was like, okay, so I should probably get someone else uh, too. Um, uh, uh. So Eldor was helping me with that until I found um, a very good teacher f- for writing, which was uh, ChatGPT. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it, uh, it came at the right time. You know, like I started using it in late in December and I had good two months to work with it. Like I, yeah, I had to do the work because you have, the chat GPT is such a thing that like, you, ha- you have to make sure that you put in the work. You, you actually make an effort. You do the work, but you just get feedback because it's very dangerous to kind of let the AI do the work for you 
Like you can, you, you sometimes like, the, the, now this is something that I want to put it, put it out because um, a lot of students or candidates want to learn writing just by reading someone's sample. They, they think magically you'll, they'll learn something by not writing themselves, but by basically seeing someone's work. It's not going to happen. It's not going to help them. And ChatGPT is like, a, it's like a, a writer that could get a bent, I don't know, 10 or 11 in IELTS writing, um, in, in writing. And, and then it's so like tempting to kind of ask, ask ChatGPT Chat to write your essay for you and just to watch and see, oh, wow, that's beautiful, right? So what happened to me was I, 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 uh, I was basically keeping a record of all these um, actual questions that were getting in, in, in exams. I, I was getting in my own exams and everyone was, you know, uh, basically... Um, putting those questions out there and uh so i was uh keeping track of them i had a long list maybe about like 30 40 questions to work on right so i started writing on a daily basis i i, I was writing an essay and sometimes i would just write the introduction and then get you know get chat gpt to give me some feedback like sometimes i would do one two three attempts before i submit it my work and then I'm like I was so sure about like okay this is a Ben 9 introduction let's see what chat GPT you know tells me and chat GPT is like, yeah it's good work but here's what how I would have done it and then it's like you see it then you get depressed it's like, oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> the same yeah um so in a way and then it for this for these two months until I got my nine I actually worked with chat GPT every single day okay that's one same here hits. same here same, same here the same yeah yeah, yeah. how about you Muhammad Ali? uh with me i think i'm about to propose a slightly unorthodox approach to improving english it's, well it's not exactly unorthodox but i'm just saying it let's based make, off let's call it traditional <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, unorthodox like unconventional not but I, I'm, on, yeah. I'm only saying that based off the all the suggestions you're making here uh, i think probably the most underrated thing when it comes to learning a foreign language is the environment. Like I think environment is really the key, right? What I, what I mean by that is uh, you basically have to surround yourself with so much of the language, uh, any format, content, video, text, and, and it's just a matter of time before your brain starts picking up on all the different you know, phrases and expressions and ideas. And I, and I think this is more natural approach to learning a foreign language. Like this is what, what I've been doing my entire life and I think it's worked out just fine for me. So, uh, well, it, I think it also comes down to your uh, goals. Like if you're someone who wants to ace IELTS test, then uh, obviously you have to get to know the exam format and you have to work on the different question types and your weaknesses and strength. But if your goal is to become a profe proficient speaker of this language, then uh, you might want to just uh, be more invested in the process itself and um, you know, try making connections with people who speak this language on a consistent basis. And if it's not that much of an option for you, then you could uh, probably get on YouTube and start watching videos, which is what I did for the better part of my teenage years. I would just basically dump all this content on my, my, on my brain and just uh, process it the next day, and which is something I still do. And, uh, and this is basically the approach we use at our school. So, uh, well, uh, but on the flip side, I gotta admit that this process may not get you the results you want in terms of IELTS if you're not spending time uh, working on the question types. So, but uh, in the long term, I'm sure you're gonna be a, a lot more fluent speaker and user of this language than someone who is stuck in the IELTS world. So uh, that, that's my take on this. Sure, that's that's my take on this topic. Um, yeah, I 100% agree with everything you guys said. Um, but it, my approach, uh, it was if you remember, I made the post like thanking everybody uh, for contributing to to this because for me it was like taking the best beats from everybody else, like the best beats. Okay, surrounding myself with English, uh, you know, using your marathons, um, watching the movies you, for example, recommended. Yeah. 
uh, taking the best bits from everybody and plugging it into my own system so that uh, I, I'm sure that uh, I don't have uh, any, what would you call it, like holes, yeah, that, uh, that are not poked. So, uh, yeah, that's what I usually try. I try to uh, be open-minded. So uh, back to the uh, topic when, you know, I, for two years I've been trying my best, like really my best uh, to do something, you know, to make it in the Forex trading. And th the only thing that I think I've, I learned, one of the biggest lessons is letting go of your ego, like my ego was holding me back for a very long time. One of my friends in that, in, you know, in that, uh, in the industry, he said that Jahangir, your biggest issue, your biggest problem is your ego. Uh, so uh, it was you, uh, at the time uh, when I was preparing, I was seeing your essays and I was like, you know, God damn it! How is he like getting this? You know, essays. Well, I, I was Ch Chat GPT. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, just no, kidding. It before Chat GPT yeah, yeah. because I've been following you for how many? Like about three years now, four years. And the thing I was looking at the essays, uh, Muhammad Ali's because of the cast essays, and I was like, how do these guys, you know, get it this right? I mean, it's impossible. And I would just look at your essays, uh, you know, forget them and don't do anything, but. I think instead I should have probably focused on uh, what you guys uh, were getting right in your essays, like you said, you know, the format, looking at the types of vocabulary use, grammatical structures. It was difficult. It's a very painful process, very painful process, you know, letting go of your ego. I, I think that was probably the biggest win in my case uh, after, you know, uh, you know, uh, leaving that uh, Forex landscape. And uh, it, it was like letting go of my ego and say, you know, Begzotica and Muhammad Ali probably have something uh, to offer. I can learn from them and I need to start learning from them instead of envying their wins, uh, envying their victories. Uh, I really liked one of your uh, posts about, uh, you said that you and Alisher, you uh, ascribe, you subscribe to this abundance mindset that there is always uh, market for everyone. There is enough uh, of, you know, there, there are enough students, there, are, there is enough space for everybody. You just need to study it. And I was like, yeah, just let, let go of your ego, uh, accept that you might be bad at some, you know, aspects of IELTS and learn from Begzotika, learn from Muhammad Ali, learn from Ms. Yildashua, and uh, eventually you will, you know, as, as it happened, like emerge victorious in this battle. I think yeah, I th I, okay. So I, I was gonna I was gonna add a little bit to that uh, when he said like about letting go of your ego and learning from those who are maybe ahead of you. Maybe it's 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 about the mindset. I think it's like as Simon I think Simon Sinek like puts it like there there are two types of mindset like finite mindset and infinite mindset. It's like finite mindset is like trying to beat others, like you're trying to you keep comparing yourself to others and trying to beat them. But when you develop an infinite mindset, you're trying to beat yourself. Like you're trying to be the best version of yourself. This is this applies not not just to IELTS, but applies to anything in life. I think like in relationships, uh, business, education. So it's it's all about probably getting into that mindset and letting go of that again. Again, the ego probably. It's very difficult, right? It, it is. Difficult. It is. Um, and on, on the note that he made, I agree that, that he was suggesting um, exposure to the language. It's, this is something that we've been talking about for a long, long time when, you know, some IELTS instructors talking about like trying to teach techniques and shortcuts. We've been suggesting, and I, I'm, I'm sure he's, uh, he was, he's, uh, he's been um, all behind it as well. Like exposure to the language is the main step, is the main approach, is the best step, to be honest. Forget about IELTS scores. It's just a number, right? Yeah. But it, it's it's all it all comes down to using the language in the most effective way. And I think you're the right person to talk about this because you've you've been exposed to the language for so many years. And then you came to the IELTS literally. So yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so talk, yeah, talk about that. Like how you ended up in the states, maybe. Like and then you said like 24 years or 25 years, how like many? spending those years. And base literally expo and and now there is a concept in ESL called critical age, uh, critical period maybe. Uh, basically, what it means is um, there's a certain age, uh, which is I think debated, a certain age uh, at, at which uh, is like 
it's it's a certain like limit to becoming a near native or native speaker like for example they say maybe the age of five like if or maybe age of two it's so it's debated it's not really decided so i want to hear your take on it like at what age should for example should you i don't know migrate to an english-speaking country or should you start living in an english-speaking country to become or to reach that level because the th again it's about mindset because i I went to the States when I was 17, so it was way past that critical period, I think. And I, the moment I accepted the reality that I would never become a native speaker, like an English native speaker, because th this is something that a lot of uh, young people strive for. Like they're like, oh, so how can I become, you know, how can I speak like an American? Or how, think how can like I, an American. Yeah, or think like an American or whatever. And then like the point is you have to let it go. You're not gonna get there. And Unless you were born or raised, you, know, you were born and raised, or maybe you moved there at a, a certain age. I don't know what age you moved uh, there, but 11. 11. Yeah, is it true Ele or not? Basically, but 11 is it might be a bit again, but it's a critical age. I think is five, but you tell us. You oh, tell well, me. You take your. You know. I have a lot to say about this topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort of topic. Um, well, first of all, uh, I went to the United States when I was 11, so that's when I haven't found myself yet you know it I was just a kid and I had two sis, uh, two sisters and they were uh, so yeah, that's like 1999 or 2000 that was two 1999 end of 19 December 1999 so we left and I think this this applies more to the my sisters were born? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying yeah. I, I gave him that, that look like yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes me feel so old <laughs> well I, I think we're the same age yeah so. when, when is your 88 uh, yeah yeah yeah. So I, w I would say it, it's different for everybody because um, I was raised here until I was 11 and then we went there and spent a good part of my life, 24, 23, 24 years, before I came back here. With family? With family, siblings. yeah. Siblings? Yeah. You're the oldest my one? My mom, yeah, I'm the oldest one, yeah. So how old were your siblings? I was 11, my sister was uh, 9 and then 7. How, yeah, how so was they the, the youngest so probably, you the know. The youngest one is... You know, we speak English at home. Yeah, <laughs> with yeah, my yeah, sisters. yeah, yeah, yeah. If one of us says something Uzbek, it's like, whoa, you know? Yeah, exactly. Said something yeah. different. But before, you know, like like my dad used to say, you know, only English, only English, try to speak in English. My dad went there first. He was there for uh, research. So he was encouraging you to maybe learn the language. Yeah, so whenever we spoke, first we went and we didn't know any English. So um, whenever we spoke to each other about anything, like, you know, daily life, he would say, translate that to English, you know, mm, okay. speak in English. Okay. So we would say, okay, so get the dictionary and then say what we said in English and then he would fix it and then he would give us advice. But then it, it came to a point where it became annoying. I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> it became annoying <laughs> because we couldn't speak anymore because it was, it was hard to, you know, whatever we said, we had to translate to English because he kind of wanted to put us into that, um, Madida, that pressure cooker where, you know, we had to, force ourselves to speak English right away because we had to go to school right away. After what age you felt comfortable speaking English? In two years. Two years. In so two years. 13, you were 12, about... 13, uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. Because, yeah. and I'll tell you why. Um, we went and I went, I started with sixth grade because I, I finished seventh grade here. I went to school early. I went, I finished seventh grade here, but because I didn't know English, they put me in beginning of middle school, which is sixth grade. So six, seven, eight was middle school. And um, I remember my dad, so he would make us you know, translate everything that we that we spoke, that we said into English. So we would all just be quiet. <laughs> so we didn't have to yeah. work so hard. But then it came to a point after, I would say three to four years, where he started saying, Uzbeche, you know, whatever we spoke. Exactly, that, that's what my said. thought was. Like, uh, because in immigrant families, like, it's the other way around. Parents are trying to encourage their kids to speak their... To, to uh, learn, yes, uh, yeah, to learn. Mother, but after mother a certain tongue, point, yeah. he's like, okay, don't forget because, where you come yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget your mother language. And then we'd say, okay, okay. And then we start speaking at all. <laughs> now we had to translate to Uzbek. So you have so, to make up your mind. Like, is, yeah, it, is it Uzbek like, or English? Like, <laughs> now we did the same thing to our kids, too. But uh, going back to your question, uh, when did you feel like you spoke at a native level? I, I never feel like I speak at a native level because I always think like I have faults. Like I never that, that's, that's how I feel too. Yeah. And it's, it's quite, it's, it's natural, it's, it's yeah. okay. So to those of you who say, you know, because you're, you're from United States, you should get a nine, it's not true. It's not, if you test United States students, like 
they would probably get like a six or seven because they don't know the difference between like a verb and adjective, you know, whatever. But you have to study for IELTS. It's not like, oh, because you lived at a certain place, you should automatically get a nine. Like, what is no, that? Really, yeah, right? it's, no, it's, you have, you need to get some training, especially in, in Yes, in, in, you yeah. speak English at a, at a certain level. You're, you're proficient at a good level and but that's all because you were in that environment. Like I was just dropped in a pool and I had to learn how to swim. You know, I don't know how to swim first and I had to learn as I went, you know, so I wouldn't sink. So I had to learn English the hard way. And I think that's the best way to learn when you create that atmosphere for it yourself. Is, yeah. You force yourself to learn English. You, you immerse yourself in the language. You immerse yourself in this, um, I wouldn't say culture, but you know, as much- Culture English, plays, culture plays an important role. part as well, yeah. yeah. But like you said, try to create that atmosphere for yourself in a place where they don't have this you know you speak english in your class for one or two hours and then after that it's all uzbek or russian wherever you go but create that for yourself and it, there are ways to do that but when i learned english um, i noticed in seventh grade that i was fluent enough to compete with united states students because i remember in seventh grade i won first place in a science fair competition for physics wow <laughs> so. yeah but my dad helped a lot with this process because he's, his uh, field is science. But I would say when I was in 10th grade, that's when I was comfortable enough to read any book in English and understand it. So my reading comprehension, that's when I realized, okay, I can do this. I can go to college. I can apply for college just like any other students here. So I was in competition with United States students after a few years. Until then, I was kind of, you know, in the back and not sure how to say things, not to ask, you know, how to you know, maybe go to the bathroom or get some water, I would just be quiet. But then um, my confidence grew as I immersed myself or I, as I was immersed. And after winning that competition, it went, you know, <laughs> so I said, and I can do this. If I can win this competition, I can do well. So, but in high school, in ninth and 10th grade, that's when we learned grammar rules. Mm -hmm. I remember that's when we took English, that would be our Onatela class, you know. English language and that's when they teach you all the rules with English and the sentence structure everything that you need for IELTS <laughs> they teach you in ninth and 10th grade but the way they teach is to speak your mind not like in a certain structure like IELTS requires so I my problem with IELTS was writing too much speaking you know writing my mind too much and I remember my first exam for task one I wrote maybe 300 words you know, and with task two, it's a, yeah, it's a big no, no, right? Yeah, for task with one. task two, I wrote like 400 and I had like 10 minutes to spare. I was, a, I'm a fast typer and they teach that there too. But, and then I was like, okay, what else can I do? What else can I add <laughs> right? <laughs> to 400 words? It says minimum 250. So there's no max. Cause I didn't know about, I didn't learn about IELTS, what it requires. So it's not like write as much as you want, but there's a limit to it. But in the United States, that's what they teach you to do. You know, your essays are like 20 pages. So I think that that was that's the the biggest difference between TOEFL and IELTS. Like I think that's what I heard. I have I haven't officially taken the TOEFL test apart from the fact that we were I think tested on TOEFL back in 2005 when I was applying for this exchange program. But we, I never got to know the results. I wouldn't know. So I I always say I don't have any experience with TOEFL. But uh, the thing is, th they say the in TOEFL the more you write, the higher score you get. Yeah. It, I think that's the fluency. American yeah. kind of way of, I think, exactly. Yeah, so rewarding all my, students. All of our essays for homework were like, you can't write less than a page. So, and you know, single spaced, <laughs> one full page, full margins, single space. You had to write less, you know, more than one page. Otherwise you would just get less than 70, you know? So I, I worked all my life to write long essays, to express my opinion, <laughs> to write really long theses and to give so many points in my essay to elaborate on my ideas. And then I come here and I was like, no, only two, <laughs> and, you know, 150 words, 250 and words. And don't feel bad. I think it's the so, same way in yeah. Uzbek writing as well. Yeah. The more you write, right? Universities, the they ask like, you to fill out uh, all the notebooks. Yeah, yeah. No, 12 well, page. No, no, <laughs> not even like, <laughs> even, in, even in essay writing, you have to write, a, you know, you have to include those sayings maybe, yes. right? Yes. Quotes. Oh, like, there were so many books that we analyzed. You know, like we just said essays and quotes. We had to analyze books. Yeah, and, and write, citations, like, reports, right? Like include citations, citations and yeah. Analyze the author's purpose, the theme, the tone, the narrative, all these little elements of, you know, literary so criticism. So it's, it's a different basically. type of essay then. Yeah. It's, it's not so an aisle. I come here and then 
what I had to work on with my, like when I said I had to work on my points of weakness, my points of weakness were, you know, I had to condense everything <laughs> into that certain <laughs> limit, into that structure. So that was really hard for me to work on because I was used to writing <clears throat> in a different style. So that was the challenging part for me. Reading and writing, they were okay. And speaking, I had to work on, you know, condensing my answers, like just with writing, I had to condense my answers to whatever time limit that I had. But writing was the most difficult part for me because um, it was a different style that was required. And in the United States, after high school, I went to bachelor's and in my master's program, um, same thing, we had to write a lot. We had to do right. a lot of yeah. project-based exactly. essays yeah. and I had like a group of like five or six teammates. And I was really good at criticizing other people's writing and I loved it and I still enjoy doing that. <laughs> no, no wonder you're a teacher now. I right? enjoy no. criticizing essays because, um, you know, I like grammar. I like working with grammar. I like fixing grammar and it makes me feel like I can put it into a certain structure and improve it. So what I would do is I would have all my team members write their part of the essay and then I would compile it together at home and then make the finalized draft and then I would submit it to the teacher and we would get a really good score. And those students were all United States students. They were native English speakers, but they had so much grammar mistakes. And I would be like, oh, and she's from here, she's from there. And look at me fixing their mistakes. It made me feel better in a way, you know, my ego, right? I, I think, yeah, I think, uh, like, I think us non-native speakers, we tend to focus so much on grammar. Yes, exactly. To a point that we can even see some common errors in native speakers as well. Yeah, but like yeah, you, that doesn't you, mean, yeah, we're better no, at English than them, but just, yeah, on, grammar, right? grammar, yeah. It's like when you, for example, when I, when I teach math to my students, I focus on, because um, I know what their weaknesses are, and I can help that, you know, I can fill those gaps. So I focus on that, but they say, you know, you should teach me about other things soon. I said, no, you have to learn this first before you get to, you know, the other parts. So this is fundamental knowledge. So when you have that fundamental knowledge, like when you have that foundation and it's stable and you're, you're confident about it, then you can build on it any way you want. Mm -hmm. So I had that foundation and I just had to improve some things, but like I said, in my master's program, we had to write a lot of essays and we had to do a lot of projects. And um, I never thought before, like when we came here, that English and IELTS would be like, such a big uh, thing for me. But when I was there, it was mostly my everyday thing. It was my, it was a part of my life, you know? And I had teachers who, whose essays that I fixed for research papers, for publications. And I think all of that prepared me for IELTS. So when I'm teaching, when I'm teaching, I can't say you know go to the United States, live for 24 years, and come back and take IELTS for a nine. <laughs> yeah. So I have to find the, I have to condense that to their version and give them good enough advice that they can follow, that they can replicate, that would help them. So I think a lot about this in my classes and when I teach. That's what I think a lot of. So how did I do with reading, and how can I translate it to their way so that it would be useful for them? Because if I have to teach the way I learned. It would take a great amount exactly, of time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it would require different things. It would require a different setting. It would require different materials. Like I never used IELTS books. You know, Cambridge books. I never used them. The first time I saw them was when I started teaching IELTS. That I said, Oh, there's a books for IELTS. Let me, let me look at it. So. But yeah, you keep coming back <laughs> to IELTS. But I, I actually want to talk more about you know. English, like again, learning the language in a different way. I think two of us yeah, uh, of go course. way back, and our generation had, um, a, we didn't really, we weren't really exposed to the language much. Like, for example, even if I were like going to this special school specialized in English language, English and math, I was really good at like, again, doing those grammar tests, right? But now that I think about it, until I went to the States, I, I had never heard a, 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 an a authentic, like a, a genuine yeah. native, a native speech English, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. never heard, like never been exposed. Yeah. So the first time around I went to the States, I was welcomed by my host father. Uh, so we got into a car. I, uh, I was on the front seat and he said something. He, he basically asked me to put on the seat belt. He said something, but I couldn't, re I didn't, that was the first time I'm hearing English, right? So the only thing I heard was belt. 
and I had no idea, so I was just fixing my belt. <laughs> probably buckle up, probably yeah, buckle like, up. <laughs> no, he said, like, put on your seat belt or fasten your seat belt, something along those lines. But I was, like, fixing my belt, embarrassed. Yeah. Like, and then there was this guy in the back, another exchange student from Russia. So he, was an, he, yeah, he had been spending some time there, so he was like, no, just the seat belt, like, in Russian. And I was like, oh, okay, sorry. And then I remember finding myself in a bio biology class and the teacher, you know, would talk so fast. And like, I, like, unlike you, I actually went there prepared. I had some English, I had some confidence. I knew the, la I thought I knew the language, but I didn't. Turns out I didn't, nothing, not a word. Didn't understand a word, sitting there, nothing. The next day comes, teacher asks something, Everyone is turning in, like they, they basically turning in their assignments, I think. And I was like, what is, what, what is this? So we were used to the word homework. I didn't really understand the word assignment. So they, he gave an assignment the, the previous day, so I didn't really know. So it was embarrassing. It was really embarrassing. But you had some, uh, probably some time to kind of adjust to it, adjust to life. And, but we had only one year, and I had to find my way around and you know learn master the language but, but, but you see yeah. i'm listening to all of you and of course uh, i agree with talking about environment especially when you said that you have to surround yourself with the english but now, now you can do it with youtube videos yeah, at the moment do, yeah. yes yeah. nowadays i think youtube internet i mean podcasts and everything yeah, is exactly, available yeah. but yeah. still yeah. We, we are missing something if information available why not everyone is speaking english so fast why are they not learning so fast why are they not at the same level because so is it is it about let me talk uh, let me put the question uh, differently let's talk about the focus yeah it's all about the consistency as you said but it's also about the focusing right focusing on the right approach yeah, yeah. right yeah. approach yeah. so when you surround yourself with the environment and in, in the environment how you focus how you keep your focus how you, you teach your students to keep your focus on English. I mean, it's not easy. For example, as you said, you can just come to the, your lessons, do two, uh, two hours your lesson, then go home and start speaking English, uh, speaking Uzbek, for example, or you start talking with your friends. How about you guys? I mean, how do you focus? Keep your mind set in English. So where is the trick? Good ex is there any it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a long-term commitment, and it's not about chasing after the shortcuts. You know, it's, it's not going after shortcuts because a lot of these young younger generations now they they come and they're like, okay, so I need this eight in three months. Okay, so and then I go like, so what is your current score? So like, I just got my score and uh, it's five point five, but I need an eight in three months. I heard that you're you know you're a good teacher, so show me the way. I'm like, mm, you know, three months, not really sure. Because uh, you need the time, you need the commitment, you need the mindset. Yeah, so it's, it's all about, I think, exposure, long-term commitment. I have a really yeah. good um, example for this, but not with English. I took French for five years in high school because you have to learn the second language, language exactly second yeah. language so i chose french because you know it's beautiful i might use it in my life right so i took french for five years and i decided to go study abroad so i went to paris to study abroad when i went i didn't know anything you know people were talking i had a host family just like you did in the united ah, states so okay so it, it happened my, with you with, with french with yeah, french yeah. so my host family they were really nice they were understanding they had other host students so they had experience dealing with students like me who who came to this place and Suddenly they forgot everything they learned in high school. So I didn't know any French. I realized, you know, five years was nothing. You know, you learn from books and you teachers and you do homework, but that's not enough. So in one month that I spent in France, I only went there for one month. In one month, I spoke best French I ever had in my life. I remember shooting a video for my parents on my last day, and I was just blah, 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 talking a lot. And it was all in French and it was amazing. I had this confidence in myself. In one month, I learned more French than I did in five years. So that environment, I, after I came back to the United States, of course, I started losing my French because I didn't, I didn't focus on that anymore. But I bought a book in French. It was a storybook. And I, I tried so hard to keep my French, to not forget it. So I read this book every night, one page every night. But slowly, I got out of it because I couldn't find time for it. Instead, I'd rather spend my time for something else that was more urgent or useful. So I didn't dedicate myself to this language, to keeping my language. That's why I forgot a lot of it. So going back to your topic, focus 
also you have to intentionally make yourself do it. You can't just say, okay, um, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I can't create this environment for myself. But you can, but you have to force yourself to do it. Yeah, yeah, you have to like leave you your comfort to, zone and yeah, be, you be have vulnerable. Yeah, to challenge yourself. Yeah. It's gonna be a struggle. You have to expand your, you know, comfort zone. It's gonna be hard, but you you will see at a certain point you will, you know, it'll change. You know, exactly. Yeah. Your oh, mindset like will switch. change. Because you talk about environment a lot, and based on our conversation so far, like you constantly trying to speak in English all the time. Yeah, um, actually, I'm going to say something similar to what Ms. Mamura just said. I think success in language learning, actually, in life in general, comes down to self-control. Like, this is something I had to learn the hard way. So over, you know, years of making mistakes, I realized that what a lot of successful people have in common is the fact that they uh, know how to, you know, uh, get things done and and they understand that if we're left to our own devices, uh, we, we're crazy. We just uh, have fun and we, we, we just take, we take things for granted. So it's, uh, I think at this, uh, in today's world, like it's very important that young people today have some kind of a disciplinarian in their life, whether it's a mentor or a, or a parent, someone who can you know, discipline them and keep them grounded. But it's so, a problem these days. It's a huge uh, problem. Yeah, it's it's like a lot of teenagers. I think are left uh, to uh, their, need to. They are left on their own. They are not being watched by their parents. Like lack of parental supervision, uh, combine that with uh, uh, bad influences on social media. You have a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I feel is uh, self discipline. I think and self control is something you can teach through sports. Like this is something I learned uh, when I got into uh, fitness. I started hitting the gym uh, a while ago, and uh, I realized that you know, on those days when it feels hard, you kind of have to, you know, kick your butt and uh, and, and drag. And yourself let's talk to the about gym. that picture, the photo that you posted <laughs> about the uh, about yeah the the change. I was really amazed to see how you you know got into shape, like. Yeah, transformation. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, let's talk about that, that photo. And <laughs> how long ago was that photo? Like? Uh, twenty twenty, probably tw around twenty twenty. Yeah. So just just in three years. So, uh, what happened with me? What with me was I. Uh, yeah, I just had to discipline myself, and it was uh, a lot of pain. I have to admit, and 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 uh, that's I think the main issue. Like a lot of young people aren't willing to go through that pain unless they are made by someone else. So, and, and that, that's kind of the philosophy we have back in my hometown. I, I don't really feel uh, bad about uh, making all my students rehearse their lines or learning a bunch of words and phrases uh, because I kind of think it's like a necessary evil that will serve them in the long run, in the long term. So someone has to uh, watch so who, over them. who did yeah. it for you? Who, who was your mentor, so to speak? Mr. Jurev. Uh No. In terms of fitness, let's let's say getting into because I feel like it's the the, the this lifestyle that you um, uh, adopted, so to speak, it kind of goes in line with all your other goals, and it it might actually help you with your language. It helps you with your other aspects of life. Yep. So, um, uh, yeah. So I was I'm, I'm kind of curious how you like. What what made that change in your head? Like, when it yeah. happened, this yeah, yeah this, this switch, switch <laughs> like like going into okay, yeah. so I gotta get into shape because otherwise was it like turning moment? Yeah, what was the turning oh, no. turning point? Yeah, uh, no, not exactly. Actually, I'd been wanting to uh, get into fitness for for a long time before I got into fitness. It's just I couldn't afford it. Uh, but once I had the means, I. Uh, Finally, decided to bite the bullet and go for it. And uh, there wasn't like I like I said in the previous on the previous podcast episode I was on. It wasn't like one turning mo moment in my life. It was like a culmination and the, the accumulation of uh, situations, moments I had in my life that kind of uh, made me realize that I couldn't I couldn't be the same guy I was and have the things I wanted in life. So I had something had to change. So 
Yeah, that's. Uh, but again, back to my point about self-discipline and self-control, it's uh, something you absolutely need if you want to see yourself succeed, succeed, not just in language learning, but in any walk of life. Yeah. So just, um, just get a hold of yourself and control your impulses, and you will put yourself in top 1%. That's a guarantee. Yeah. Um, Good <clears throat> turn. <laughs> So talking about the, 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 the struggles, challenges, and difficulties when you're trying to, you know, uh, get into, when you're trying to adopt ha- habits. Uh, I, I haven't tried it myself, but in my experience, I do agree with the point on this uh, turning points, turning junctures in your life that, that for me, it also like didn't work. Like, you know, just, you know, tomorrow I wake up at five and go to the gym, that's it. Yeah, it didn't work out, honestly, no. Uh, it didn't really work out. I think w- w- the, one of the things before the podcast that we, we had discussed with you was uh, the power of just showing up. Uh, the power of showing up. I, I think if you put it like simply, uh, try to make the change as frictionless as possible. Just start little by little. Yeah, incorporate into your life little by little. Uh, even if you're not learning 10 words today, at least learn three. That, 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 that would do. Just, just do three words, okay? Uh, it worked out for me uh, because, uh, as I like, if you remember, I said that when I don't feel like going out uh, to do to do my, you know, uh, workout done in the gym, I usually just take a walk uh, in the park nearby. Yeah, I do a little bit of uh, jogging, and I feel like, you know, at least I did something. And the day when it's over, I feel like it wasn't wasted. So I feel like. I'm not sure. Again, I'm I'm not professional in this. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about making changes. You know, motivation and stuff. Uh, for me personally, if you want to incorporate uh, new changes into your life, please uh, make it or uh, gradual. Make it. Not sure if, if if it works for everybody, but I do it very slowly usually, and I try to make it as frictionless as possible. So the less friction there is, uh, the less uh, what you call it like overwhelming. Uh, uh, le- the less overwhelming it seems and the smoother the transition is. So that's how it works for me. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I personally, it's very difficult for me to say that there was a turning point. It's more, it was like more a turning period of life. Yeah, it was very, uh, what you gradual. call gradual. It was gradual, incremental, step by step. Uh, I started to change, yeah, because uh, it hits you one time, like, you know, you're not getting this right, you're not getting this right, you're not getting this right, you're not getting this right. You see it happen for five, six times, you see a pattern, and you're like, you know, there, there is something wrong that I'm doing in the writing part, which is grammar. You see, like five times in a row, your grammar score is six, so you need to change that. So for me personally, it's uh, more about like oh, doing it in increments, doing it step by step, uh, and I try to make those changes that you want uh, as frictionless as possible, as challenging as possible, if possible, of course. Again, I'm not professional. Uh, I'm, I'm not a prof- oh, oh, I'm not an expert in this, but that that would be my take on you know uh, on the point you've made. Uh, so uh, one more minute, and uh, the point about uh, living in the U.S. So uh, I actually grew up in Russia. Uh, I think the same. Yeah, yeah I grew up in Russia. Uh, for like 14 years of my life. It was 2000 when I uh, yeah with we, my family went to Russia. Like all of my family members. Uh, we went to, the, to to Russia, and I remember the first time I heard Russian people speaking. It was, it was, uh, it was just m- mumbling, you know. It was gibberish, and I was like, "What is she saying?" It was my uh, kindergarten, uh, yeah, the, the one from kindergarten, and she came to, uh, to visit us. Uh, for the first time, actually, I saw a white person. <laughs> with with blonde hair, that was a shock. Honestly, that was a shock, and I was like, "Wow, what a beautiful lady in our house!" And uh, I got introduced in that world. And I think the the, the, the things that helped me in my journey uh, in learning Russian was just input, a lot of input, just listening, 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 and then I started to speak Russian. Yeah, it'll come uh, out. As you, I forgot Uzbek. Uh, then I started to speak Uzbek when I came to Uzbekistan. Uh, and uh, it all again switched, you know, my first language was Tajik, then Russian, uh, then I came to Uzbekistan, it's uh, Uzbek, uh, then I forget Russian, and now it's English. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like computer settings, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like the, the language like go up in the yeah. order. Yeah. And 
It was really interesting, and I feel like you were right about uh, the the uh, your father probably was right by sometimes forcing you to translate stuff because in my case that the, the same happened. They just gave me a notebook and said, "Jehungir, you're going to write these letters in Russian 500 times or 600 times." It, I don't, I'm not sure if there is a more efficient way to do that, but. My parents, yeah, they forced me sometimes. They spoke with me in Russian, but at the same time, they spoke to me also in Uzbek so that I don't forget the language and in Tajik. So I knew all those languages. And it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So as you can see, like in both cases, and Ms. Mamura's and Jahangir's case, they both had a disciplinarian in their life. You know, someone, you know, I'm yeah, hearing. That's, both, that's what they both have in common. Hearing all your stories, how about the necessity? Is it important or not? Hundred percent. I mean, to learn to, language. To, yeah, to learn language. I mean, basically, I'm hearing that there there should be necessity to learn the language or learning something. I, or I not. mean, I wouldn't say. I mean, it's different situation for everybody. Like the way people learn anything depends on their situation, what you know, their um, priorities, priorities, right? But the consistent thing among this is that there's somebody showing you how it's done or at least even if you don't have anybody showing you, you follow somebody on social media maybe who who have done this before. So because if you don't have, like um, because like I said, if you don't have uh, anybody to look up to, you, you'll be the one taking the bullet. You'll be the one paving the way first. So you'll, be, you'll become the role model for other people. Mm -hmm. But if you have somebody in your life who can show you the way or who can actually at least you know guide you in a certain way, it could be a teacher, your parent, anybody, right? It could be a friend then it would make things easier for you and you would see what would happen if you take certain steps because the other person has done the same thing. So you try not to follow, you know, you try not to repeat their mistakes, you learn from their mistakes. So that's the goal of whole student mentor relationship, right? When you have somebody to look up to and then they teach you what to do, what not to do from their own experience. And then you hopefully do the same thing for your, for the next, um, for your students. Yeah, but oh yeah, I, I was talking about like uh, student and mentor relationship. I think I was once listening to uh, it was uh, I know you might have liked it, like Jordan Peterson uh, lectures. I like him. Yeah, now, some people like, some people don't, and uh, it was an interesting point he made. He made uh, he said this that mm, I'm coming back to like teaching right now, and uh, he said this that oh, at a certain point uh, when we teach students, one thing, one important thing that we forget is that we forget how to be a student what it feels like to start learning a new language, which is like English in this case. Uh, I think I, 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 in, like lately after getting a nine, I, I, I focused more on improving my teaching skills. And um, yeah, I, I'm trying like the method you, you, you suggested, which is try and find a way to immerse your students in the language itself, like surround them with English. And um, yeah, yeah, I think, oh, like the, the fact that you learned uh, French, yeah, they had to relearn Uzbek, yeah, and uh, I think it helps in a way to, you know, to show you yourself how like a student should be learning a new language. Yeah, so uh, I think when, uh, when you are uh, trying to improve the way you teach, I think one of the ways could be to reverse engineer everything which is uh, go back to your origins and I know st start learning a new language and you will see if, if the things you advise work or not. For me, it was like German recently. I started learning it and I found out that, as you said, again, surrounding myself with German stuff, like, you know, switching everything to German in my settings, switching everything in Telegram to German, uh, uh, listen, you know, uh, putting uh, like a calendar in German. I remembered everything so much more uh, effectively and the, uh, you remember the piece of advice you give about the word that should appear 25 times? Yeah, yeah. To, it works. For you to own it, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it works. And when you, again, make it frictionless, like as I said, every day you open your phone and you see everything, the apps, uh, the videos, uh, the messages, uh, the notifications, everything is in German. And, and little by little, you, you know, it's, you take those steps and you learn it and it's very seamless transition very seamless, uh, not very challenging. And you, I kind of enjoyed it. And I think, uh, and you also made the point about how to teach students to focus. Uh, I have no idea, honestly. I think without, without a clear goal and a mentor, it would, be, uh, it would be an uphill struggle for most students. I don't think it's, 
uh, very easy to do on your own unless you've got some super popular genetics like Elon Musk does. But again, for Elon Musk, I think he also had uh, role models in his life, like his dad. Yeah, like they had some uh, cobalt mine or something. And he knew uh, how to do that. But in my opinion, yeah, mentor, very good mentor, very good tutor is important. Uh, role model in your life that you can look up to and follow in their footsteps. Yeah, so... Uh, otherwise, you have to learn the hard way. Uh, yeah, as years. Mohammed Ali put it, it yeah. it's going to be very, very hard. It was very hard for me unless uh, I personally myself like found uh, Jordan Peterson. He he taught a lot of good things. There are things he, he doesn't get right, but I mean, uh, there are also a lot of things I can, you know, take away from him. And or, yeah, so mentor is very important. Making transition, again, I'm coming back to the same point, like making it as seamless and frictionless as possible is very important, my opinion, so yeah. So we're talking about the learning from your own mistakes and because all of you mentioned this. So how important is to uh, track down your progress, for example, in the in your consistency, in your learning the language, literally. So do you advise to your students or how do you have to correctly do that? Do you have a different approach for that or do all of you? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I might be, you know, taking. No, no, yeah. no, it's your time today. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah. you, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I think uh, some students, uh, again, with Muhammad Ali before we discussed this uh, really interesting stuff, there is this saying, I don't like it, honestly, it's, which is like, uh, fake it till you make it. I honestly don't like it that much, I don't know. Uh, and some people say this, that like you should never give up. I don't know, it, it didn't work for me because if I never gave up, I would have continued down those that trading path forever and would have probably messed up my entire life. Uh, so I think it's important to be reasonable in your choices that you make. Um, yeah. Again, I forget. I, f I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> About focus. Uh, focus. Checking your progress. Checking your progress. I think it's important. And uh, if I didn't take that IELTS and didn't get that 8.5 uh, that I got like in my second try, like before getting that 9 after the EOR, and if I, let's say I would have gotten an 8, Yes, I would have been so devastated emotionally, 100%. I, I have no idea how I would have uh, made that comeback that I needed to make, to make all of that happen. So I think keep track of your progress, figure out where you are lacking and try to uh, fix that or have somebody, like you said, a tutor that can help you fix that problem. And when you when you see that you are making progress, that, that, that you are having success with whatever you're taking up, it just makes you feel good. That's that will happen with me, honestly. Yeah, I, f I saw that 8.5, and I was like, yeah. You see, the hard work paid off. But what if it's not? At that time, you start doubting yourself, and I think self doubt is probably one of the biggest reasons why so many these days, why ma so many people these days don't try to take risks. And again, I'm not uh, a motivational speaker, I'm not saying to take risks. I'm saying that if you get rid of that self-doubt and try, I think you might have success with whatever you want to try. Uh, that what happened with me when I registered for IELTS. I just came, I said, well, let's register three times. You know, we'll take IELTS three times. Let's see what's going <laughs> to happen. One time. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I take the risk, registered, and it worked out. I'm not saying it's going to work out for everybody, but it worked out for me. So uh, if possible, get rid of self-doubt if you can. Uh, again, make the transitional seamless. Uh, keep trying, yeah. Yeah, focus. I mean, exactly. I agree with you 100%. And also, um, when you fail, like when you don't get the results that you want, it's actually a good thing, right? I mean, I like failing because that's when I know that's me giving myself feedback, you know? And th the person who knows you best is yourself who knows your weaknesses, your strengths. So when you fail, when you don't maybe on IELTS or whatever, when you don't get the scores that you want, students sometimes give up. They said, okay, I got five or, you know, six and that's it. I'm not going to take IELTS anymore. This is, you know, this is me. But that's not you. It's just one time that you take IELTS. Maybe you took a mock exam and you, you got a higher score than what you got on the real exam. So you, you get, they start doubting themselves and they, they lose this confidence that they had. They, they get demotivated and also overwhelmed because now they have to study really hard if they want to get a higher score. And um, some students ask me, I didn't really get a good score on my mock exam and I'm, I don't want to take the exam right away because I want to give myself another year to study. Okay, if you want to take a year to study, that's fine. You think you're going to get that score that you need after that year? They said, I'm not sure. 
you know, have a plan. If you want to get a high score, then like you said, take baby steps. You don't have to just jump and nobody's, nobody's ever, I don't think any of you here have ever done, you know, what you do best in one try, right? You have yeah. so many failures and that's what you learn from. You make mistakes and then you see where your mistakes are like that, um, score breakdown i finally got my score breakdown after like two months waiting because i asked for all four exam score breakdown at the same time that's what probably took a long time to get <laughs> that's where i saw oh you know one time i got a four for writing i think it was for task response and oh, I, I don't that's why i got a you know seven because i got a four over here you know that's when you'll know but i got Th that's that's another end. reason why i think we're seeing so many nines now because of the scores breakdown official yeah. because for you, for you so many years those. it wasn't available I see. Back in the oh, day, really? it wasn't available. <laughs> so. actually, yeah, actually, we, we were having the conversation about that. Why all of a sudden this year, if you remember, uh, we have so up, many, yeah, yeah, so yeah. many nines now. We didn't have them before, and all of a sudden yeah. this year we have like uh, so many nines. We already have a candidate who is actually constantly scoring eight, eight point five. Literally, yeah. we're yeah. not talking about yeah. that, which is quite high. So it's, it's about the feedback that you get, like from this scores breakdown. I think. Well, some of them, some, some of, them. some it's of it, some of it. Yes, we'll come back to this. Yeah. Conversation. Sure. We'll come back yeah. to this question. Anyway. Yeah, so you can see like where how you did on any section. And for example, I thought I did really bad on my uh, task two. I got an eight for writing uh, two times. And I wrote the same exact way that I did for both of them. And I still got, you know, well, the second time I tried to improve, but I got the same uh, grade. But I never knew why, because I thought my writing two was uh, the problem. because. Like I said, I, I tend to write a lot and write too many ideas. So I tried to restrict myself. I tried so hard to restrict myself to not write too much or not to write too many ideas. But uh, I got the same grade. When I got my score breakdown, but that was after nine. So I, that's just to see how I did on my previous exams, like what changed from eight, mm. to, you know, eight to nine. And my task one was actually seven, and my task two was all nine. So the whole time when I was teaching to students, I didn't have this confidence to teach them task two because I thought I didn't do well on task two. But now I know I should focus on task one uh, yeah, it <laughs> for was myself as well. Alicia actually, was, when I texted him, he said, apply for score breakdown. It, it's likely that you have problems with task one. Yeah, because if you remember in your case, it was nine, 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 nine and seven, 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 seven in your task one. Yeah, and Alicia said that, uh, was that he had the same problem and probably I also have the I same you issue. told me that you have the same problem right I, I yeah I that that was when I um, got the news like that was the that was the time I scored 8.5 in writing that was the exact combination four nines and four sevens so I think it's just a big bit I think we're not really used to writing reports like business reports so it all comes down to that like it's not like just and experience. plus Uzbek people are not really good at writing in general we don't really communicate in writing much um, the same goes like our whole education system uh, revolves around testing like multiple choice questions yeah same format so yeah. right so the, uh, now I think it's changing for the past four or five years but um, when I was at school uh, I, we, 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 we were programmed to kind of basically beat the test beat the multiple choice questions not really put our thoughts in in a writing format, in a writing format, in a written format, so to speak. So that's one thing. And uh, another thing is we're actually good at really speaking because we tend to uh, communicate in, uh, in verbally so much so that that's kind of that reflects uh, in our scores. And when I say we, I, I mean Uzbek people in general. But I want to uh, get back to this, to your question about this uh, keeping progress, keeping track of your progress. I think when it comes to language learning, this is something that you shouldn't do, maybe. Students shouldn't do. They, they should forget about, like, because... Interesting. One, okay. Yeah, yeah, because one thing that I hear most is like, okay, so students approach me and say, well, uh, you suggested listening to podcasts to improve my listening. Uh, or to read articles to improve my reading, but I've been doing that and I don't see any results. So the problem is you're trying, you're trying, you're, you're keeping progress. You're trying to keep progress instead of just enjoying the whole journey. Process, just enjoy yeah. the process. Don't keep track of your results. And if you keep, if you keep taking the mock tests over and over and just to see where you're at, like, I don't really see. It's like, uh, it's like testing yourself 
over and over, and you never, like, you don't even, you, it's not even, it's not, like, the, the mock tests, I don't think they're reliable enough to give you the exact picture, right? So, instead of focusing on those results, maybe, they should just focus on learning the language, enjoying the process, having fun with it, and then when the right time comes, it, it will all happen. Like, it, so you start seeing results. I think it's like, uh, it's just like the saying, um, the watched pot never boils. Like when you keep yeah. expecting the results, it never happens, I think. There's so it's, a, it's when you should, yeah, it's when you should like, you just start enjoying the process and then all of a sudden the result is there and when you get to that result just like the band nine i think all of us had, ex had experienced that you you're actually you real you realize that you're in love with the process with the journey um, and not yeah the, much more than yeah. than the, the whole result. The, the result yeah, yeah. so yeah. I, I actually got another quote to yeah. capture this one. I got yeah. a lot of quotes in the store. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not one that I'm I think say. I need to introduce you to Otterbeek <laughs> Markel. Uh, well, because they put everything so neatly, precisely. So um, uh, this is actually something, the quote I'm about to share is the one I got off the internet. I, I was introduced to quite recently, and it goes, uh, the man who loves walking walks longer than the person who loves the destination yeah. Mm, yeah so that kind of yeah captures yeah the whole point he was trying to make and as for your question on whether or not students should be tracking their progress their mistakes i kind of have a slightly different take on this one uh, so uh, i think they should and the way we do it at our school is by getting every single one of our students to run their own blog so they have their own Telegram blog where they have to write a reflection post pretty much every day on how they, they went and, and, and talk about every single experience and interaction they had with their teacher in the classroom and outside the classroom. So, and, and we think this kind of helps them become more self-aware. And it also gives them like a sense of uh, like progress, where they were yesterday and where they are now and where they are headed. And, and, and every now and then you can go back and reflect on those old posts and see what the kind of person you were in the past and, and how far you've come. And that kind of gives you a sense of fulfillment, accomplishment. So and this is something I've personally been doing lately too. If you've been following us on social media, I write wrong, long reflection posts. But every time I sit the exam though, <laughs> not like every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, and those are the posts that uh, and not only help me uh, look back and, and do some self -intros introspection, but also uh, they kind of help me uh, articulate myself. Like I have to uh, come up with the right combination of words to describe the you know the feelings and the uh, experiences I went through. So it is not. I, I guess it's not only just a, um, a enlightening process where you get to learn a lot about yourself, but also something intellectually enriching, something that helps you grow your uh, language skills because you're forcing yourself to talk about it. So as opposed to uh, keeping everything to yourself. So yeah, and r writing, so if you, you made it, yeah, writing equals thinking. thinking. Yeah, right. And, and, and this is something also, reflection post-writing, it's something also helped me to develop what I call constructive thinking. Uh, constructive thinking, it's when you think in an orderly manner. Because what I believe is writing and speaking is simply a reflection of our thoughts. So if you wanna get your writing and speaking in order, then you should start with your mind. So, and, so the way you do that is you have to force yourself to speak and write and, um, and, and try being logical in your point. So what am I saying? Why am I saying that? How can I best demonstrate it with an example? And uh, what's my final point? Uh, and you see a manifestation of this in, the, in writing task two as well, where you're asked to present a point, explain it with examples, and summarize it. So, yeah. Give your opinion. 
Mm? Yeah, and give your opinion. Yeah, yeah, and give your opinion as well. By the way, do you agree with the? Well, some people say that the, actually, when you speak in other languages, your personality changes. For learning from all of you, for example, you you know Tajik, right? Yeah. Then you I, speak I have English. To, I have to answer this one. I have to. I have <laughs> to. Take this then how question. many languages do you know? Like English, Russian, yeah, Uzbek. Let's say some, you some know some Tajik. Some also, you also have a. F- now you have. We learned that you know French. So does the language change your personality, for example? Exactly. Have you ever noticed it anything does. like this? It does. Yeah. Can I please take this question? Yeah. Yes. I have, to, I have to ask that question because, uh, so what we are trying to do really here is to break down the science of language learning. And uh, another missing component in this equation, I believe, is uh, identity change. The reason why it comes to me natural to speak this language is because I am not the same guy I used to be. Like, and this is... Uh, part of the reason why a lot of the language learners go through this language barrier and takes years to finally kind of feel natural speaking this language because uh, they expect to be the same guy and with the same beliefs and 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 see themselves speak entirely different language uh, an alien language perfectly language learning is more than just memorizing phrases and a bunch of facts it's a language and culture go hand in hand so if you want to find yourself one day speaking fluently at a native level then uh, you you have to really expose yourself to their culture and be kind of open-minded and um, what i'm saying probably parents watching this not going to like this idea because who, who wants to see their kid become a different individual right because that creates that distance but uh, this is the price you have to pay if you want to learn to speak another language through and through. Yeah. How about you, Bezos? Do you agree with that? I, I, yeah, I agree completely because I think the culture plays an important role you know, when you're learning a new language, uh, especially like when, when it comes to... I always associate language learning with uh, watching TV shows. Yeah, sorry. TV shows, right? Like, so sitcoms, for example. Uh, I love watching sitcoms, and I always encourage my students to, to do the same because Friends, it probably. teaches you, uh, yeah, it teaches you not only about the language, but the, they, they make these cultural references so that you can kind of, you know, you start to see these cultural differences and you start to see how, why, why this particular joke is uh, funny. But the, yeah, I, I, I agree that it comes at a cost that uh, you you change your identity changes you become a whole different person when you reach that level I think and you have to be ready and the people surrounding you have to be ready for that change and I think it kind of happened to me um, like organically naturally when I was when I spent a year in the states when I came back I was a completely different person because I was challenged my belief system was challenged every everything that i believed was completely questioned and i think this particular like it it wasn't so much back in the day around that time it wasn't so much about the language improvement it was about the cultural uh, exposure and uh, this whole maybe identity crisis so to speak so and then i i i spent then the following three four years trying to find myself and trying to come to terms with with who I am, basically. He mentioned being an open-minded, so that, that's a critical uh, concept here. Like, you have to, ex- you either have to accept yourself or you have to go back to the person that you were before this change. And um, once you embrace this change, and, and, and it, it sometimes comes at a cost sometimes because you, you you lose i think some of your relationships change with certain people you become um, for example i you know i have so many great classmates but um there's now there's distance because of the way i think and there's i, I just don't have the common language with them when i say common language it's not like i speak uzbek fluently of course but it's we don't share the common language anymore we don't really yeah it's it's like I don't really find those discussions as, um, you know, like stimulating, stimulating as th- this one maybe. I see. Or, mm. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. So you just become a totally different person. And is it is it good or is it bad? 
the jury is out. We don't know. We don't know. Okay, I think so, Mamura has got the good experience and maybe she experienced um, this because yes. she feels like she wants to share something. Yeah. I do. I actually want to share two things. So to the previous topic, I, when you said you're uh, saying, I want to say something else too. When you keep, there's a uh, saying, when you put in the same effort as you've always done, you're going to get the same result that you've always gotten. So to get something different, to get a different result, you have to do something different, right? So especially with IELTS, uh, students who are learning English or IELTS, if you keep, like, for example, taking the same mock test over and over again without stopping, you know, for a pause and saying, okay, how did I do on this mock test? What's my problem here? Which type of question am I missing the most uh, problems on? Then you're going to get the same result. You might do a little better, a little worse, but that depends on, you know, how prepared you are. Then, yeah, so you got to, you know, add more ingredients to the qazan, right? You got to get some more stuff to the soup to make it more flavorful. So now going back to this question, I, I think I agree with both of you. It does change a person to a certain level. Like with me, it was a little different than with you because I, I learned English not because my intention was to learn English. I learned English because that was, that's the environment that I was in. And I learned it, I know, majburan. It was, you know, I, I was, Out yeah, of it was a necessity. It and was a survival thing. Yeah, it was like, a survival yeah. mode, exactly. And I either had to learn English or just struggle in school. So I learned it from the basic level, not with the intention of taking IELTS or learning English, but just because I just wanted to get a good grade in school and just to make it in life. And culture came with it. So culture and language were at the same time, it was put on me. And I had to absorb it and I had to adapt to it and it was a hard process. But just like you said, when you go out of your environment, like when you go out of Uzbekistan, you start to see the difference between how you were before and how you are after a certain experience has happened to you. So I, I realized I was changing to a different person in high school because that's when my English was good enough for me to make friends, uh, make friends and to compete with students for you know, college or, or jobs or whatever. And I was a different person in a way that uh, my perspective was different from before. Like here, you know, and this is a, uh, the harsh reality, right? The girls in Uzbekistan, they're most of them, maybe traditionally, maybe now it's not like that before, like that right now. You grow up, you go to school, and then you get married and you have kids and you, you stay at home, right? Is that still real? Yeah, <laughs> you become a stay-at-home mom. Stay yeah, at home mom. become yeah. a stay-at-home mom, right? And that, it was in, I never thought about, like, for example, getting married or all this family life when I was in, in the United States at the time. All I had to learn about was, okay, what are the kids here doing? What do they do that I have to, you know, get into this? There's a river that's going. I had to jump into it and go with it, you know? So I had to jump in and do what they're doing. And what they did was after middle school, they go to high school. After high school, they go to college. After college or after high school, I mean, mm, after they college, they have to get in, a job, yeah, yeah. right? And after that, they go to master's and then PhD or whatever. So I, without having a clear goal for why I was doing things, I was doing them just because it was the natural thing to do at the time. But then um, that's when I realized that what I was doing was different from what was maybe traditionally expected of me or girls. But my parents never um, meant for us to have this path in life. So they, they spent so much time and investment in our education. And I thank them for that, and I feel so blessed to have this opportunity because um, it changed me into a better person. I really think I became a better person than how I was before. Not just with the language or culture, but just because of the perspective. When, when I went to school, I went to school with people from so many different countries. So it wasn't just you know all American students. It was mm. people from China, from Japan. A lot of Mexican students, people from Venezuela, from Cuba. My best friend was Cuban, and um, I had an Indian friend. So, so many different personalities, different countries, different backgrounds, ethnicities, different perspectives. And I had to go along with it, and I was one of them. I was the Uzbek student, you know, from this country that nobody knew about. And <laughs> it was one of my, <laughs> yeah, it was one yeah. of my intention to kind of introduce my country, to make it part of the river, you know. Uzbekistan is also in this river. It's not, so I was a minority, but so were everybody else. And that's the beauty of living in America. Though. That's beautiful. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. you learn from different. And like you said, you learn not to judge others, you know, and you should be open minded. When you have people from different countries, different beliefs, you don't just shoot at them and criticize them for thinking the way they do. 
right? There's an anthropological um, concept called cultural centricity. Centricism? Centricity. That's a bit of a mouthful, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's about when you think your culture is the best, basically, yeah. Like the way you grew up or the way you're taught, your culture, your whole identity, that's the best among all the other cultures. It's like a superiority complex. Yeah, superiority complex, exactly. So we learned that in all those classes, and I think those were necessary for me to take. Those steps were necessary for me to go through, to take, in order to become who I am today. So, um, like you said, watching sitcoms, that's my thing. <laughs> yeah, who, what, what's your favorite sitcom? the age thing. I love Seinfeld and Friends. Seinfeld is the best. You know, my He's husband. Be- I'm, I'm going to talk about this point. I actually want to talk to you about Seinfeld as well. But it's, yeah, it's, it like is the, the, it's the father of sitcoms. Exactly. It's, it's, the, it's the thing you watch to learn about the culture. I know I don't it agree is. with everything it in is. it, right? Exactly, some things, yeah. some things don't really go with our beliefs or, you know, but it, my husband, when he moved to the United States, I, I have him, I had him watch Seinfeld and he didn't get one joke. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Seinfeld. He but I get the joke every time. I'm so I happy him. now. Like someone <laughs> is actually talking about yes. Seinfeld show. Like I tell it's, him, to understand the jokes, you have to live here a certain yeah. amount of time. You have to get the culture. You have to get how people think. It's yeah. different from how you think. And when you get, when you understand the jokes, you realize you become native. <laughs> Ex- that, when, when you, you, when you get it. the cultural references, yeah. that's when you realize that you're maybe part of that culture. Part of that culture, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So going back to your question, you know, check the progress. When you, um, like when you watch Friends or any any show, any sitcom, you have to learn the language with context. So yeah. that's where culture comes in. Culture exactly. gives you that context. Yeah. Yeah. So when I, when t- students ask me, um, how can I start learning English? Can you give me some kind of roadmap? And I say, well, you know, start with expressions, right? Like for example, good morning, hello, how are you? Exactly. Yeah. Depends on where you are. If you're at a store, maybe learn some expressions to ask how much a certain price is or to check out something. Like, uh, can you tell me how much this costs? Things like that. Where can I get a card? Things like that. In, so, in ESL terms, it's it's called like functional language. Like yeah, that's what you need to functional. Learn language. it yeah. that way because <laughs> you're gonna learn the expression first, and then you're gonna you know learn where to use those you know expressions, and it's gonna help because you learn from different contexts, and then when you continue learning, you're gonna kind of fill those bubbles. So you have this whole terminology or the whole. Um, ways of having conversations in a supermarket or ways exactly, of having conversations yeah. in a school setting, in a, like an educational setting, medical setting, whatever. And you kind of start filling those gaps, what are those? Yeah. gaps connecting for the dots. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, different uh, situations. And I think that's the best way of learning because you learn with culture, with the expressions, and that's like the native level, right? Because that's, yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Grammar, I you know? completely agree. Uh, functional language. Well, um, I did my CELTA right after I got my results, yes. the band nine. So that like CELTA was an eye opener for me, you know, like I did it with them. So that's an, maybe a little bit of an ad. Yes. Do your CELTA. If you want to teach IELTS, teach English, do your CELTA. Without CELTA, like it just, teaching doesn't really make sense, yes. yeah. you know. And the, the thing is, one thing that struck me most, a lot of things struck me most, but one thing that struck me the most when I was doing my CELTA was the um, teaching functional language or bringing functional language into classroom. Like, you know, like when you look at those books like Headway or Navigate or whatever the book that you use in teaching, there's this little box where they teach you these expressions, small expressions, yeah. that's, that's what yeah. they call functional language. And a lot of teachers, including myself, I think, what we do is we just skip over them, like skip over that little section. We think, oh, okay, so it's a little, little language. Or maybe we just teach them very quickly, like just tell the meanings, like just give the translation very quickly, yeah. but don't let students or don't let that sink in. Or, like yeah, we, digest, we need to yeah. kind of, you know, let students to maybe experiment with it, play with it, get into role play and then use the language, right? So that's what, like it was, I was like, yeah, I know that this is important, but I don't know why I wasn't even actually focusing on that because it all comes down to those little chunks of language when you're, when, when you're trying to communicate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. And I agree. In, in Thanks also, for raising that. Yeah. In a result, our book actually 
went this way and i loved that book i think we, it was solutions or something a- any but book and a- any yeah, like they esl book it's they like they have it section, yeah. but the yeah. whole book should be the, that section you know and the grammar <laughs> should be like little chunks <laughs> and little notes yeah. so and i remember uh, teaching my students this part about expressing uh, feelings different feelings and the word w- and, and the expression was oh how embarrassing yeah yeah. Ex- yeah and yeah. and they asked me what does that mean i said there's no translation there's no no direct translation translation. that's the whole point yeah so put yourself in a situation where maybe you're walking somewhere and i had this before when i was little i went to a store with my dad and he was talking with the salesperson and i was looking at the stuff and i grabbed somebody else's hand and say dad can you buy me this and then that person looked at me said i'm not your dad (laughs) so that's embarrassing that's when you yeah that's a that's a beautiful way of teaching that's the word (laughs) oh how embarrassing and they got it they got exactly. it. Exactly. So now when they're in that situation where they feel that emotion, they say, oh, embarrassing. So instead of translating in their head how to say, okay, how do you say, no, there's a word for it, right? It's, it's a native level word. It's how embarrassing. Exactly, yeah. And we have those little expressions in Uzbek as well. And it's so like, it's so rewarding to kind of realize because, okay, so there's this saying, if you don't know, if you don't speak the second, if you don't have a second language or if you don't speak the second language, you don't actually speak your own language. Like you never, that, that just goes to say, you don't really appreciate your own first language unless you actually learn a different like, foreign language, right? Because that, as it happens, I was actually, uh, I was gonna go to this restroom, like the bath bathroom. So the, there was a big line, turns out, uh, so the, the 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 lady who was watching the bathroom or getting some um, you know they're charging us to like she she's the, there to watch and so a, a guy interacts with her and like in Uzbek says so I'm gonna do, do this in Uzbek because it makes more sense. And then first it hit me like wow it's a be- like this Uzbek language is like we always say dush push oyoq poyoq. Uh, so we like nonpon, nonpon is like there, there, I don't think there is an you know right yeah like no, we don't like we don't have that in English I think right no uh, is there I don't know I don't know so that was the first and then this lady from a Russian descent I think she's she's from a Russian descent but I think she spoke fluent Uzbek she responded and I'm like Sh-. it took me a while to realize wow this this is the level of a native, it's like, there is no shower. There's like, but it's in a way, it's this, it's like, what does you the can't, shower like, do, right? yeah, so you can't really translate into English, no, but it's, it's it's an expression. Sense. It's an expression in Uzbek that like, wow. Like it was mind blowing to see this, again, a lady of a Russian descent using that piece of language in response to Dushpushbama. And exa- exactly, when the more you learn English, and I'm sure all of you have experienced, the more you realize how rich our own language exactly, is. Exactly, yeah. Right? And you There's learn so to appreciate that. There's so many that you can't translate to English. Like I, had a, I did a video once where I had a uh, hard time thinking of a word for um, Odamzad or Odamgarchilik. Odamgarchilik probably is the word, yeah. And yeah, a lot yeah. of students, they replied saying humanity, humanity. No, that's Odamzad. That's like... Maybe yeah. hu- hum- human. Human. So hum- it's, it's not. Yeah. Uh, it's compassion. Compassion. Oh, it's, it's, uh, well, it's. It's not exactly. It, it, no, it's I mean, not exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of words that can. Exactly. Add, there's that no, you can say yeah. to describe Adam oh, Garchari. Yeah. But not one word that describes it. So. I, the more uh, I learn yeah, I speak English, yeah. the more I appreciate my own language. Exactly. <laughs> Oqbatli. Oqbatli. Is that, it's is the same thing. It's the same concept. It's the same concept. Uh, give me a second. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, the, no, no, the whole point. The whole point of the discussion is that we shouldn't encourage students to translate those words. No. It's it all comes down to kind of learning within culture, with like because look at this word, like the word family, the word family. We were taught in, 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 at schools that it means oile, right? My family consists of five people. That's the first kind of, you know, language that you learn, piece of language that you learn. Family, oile, you translate. But you, you go to the States, you go to America, and then people use this word in a different context. They say, he's family. Yeah. Stranger with him. No, 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 not necessarily stranger. What I mean is, like, w- when they are describing, like, someone maybe getting into conflict, oh, he's family, like, 
umani qarindoshim, bu meni qarindoshim, his family. Like u meni oilam, tushunmaydi, tarjima qilaman sizga, lekin family is used in a different context. E bu narsani tushuntirish qiyin bolalarga. Misol uchun, family so'zini hamma birinchi Shavkat Bo'taevga hurmat saqlagan holda aytaman, lug'atlari zo'r, mana ishlatganman, lekin bitta translation qo'yadilar xolos. Hamma o'zi bilingual dictionaryda bitta translation bo'ladi xolos. Afsuski, lekin at some point you need to start using these actual dictionaries like the the advanced learners dictionaries and Yeah, go on, go on, finish, yeah, yeah. finish. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, like, you can't really learn the language by, you know, learning the translation of those words. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. That's the whole thing. Translation of the Oqabat Li. Yeah, yeah. Translation of the Oqabat Li. I don't have, uh, I have loose translation, translation, and that's, I think, fair-minded. Fair-minded. I mean, anyway, but fair, we don't loose, use it that, that often in English. translation would be fair-minded. Uh, yeah, and let me, uh, because of the care, you inadvertently started a little war here. <laughs> okay. Everybody, yeah. pay attention. Yeah, that's, that's going, going to be very, very interesting. Well, that's... Intense. You know what I'm talking about. Go ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> Muhammad Ali. Uh, no, no clue. None. Zero. About translation. Well, translating. What about it? Translating. Uh, okay. Like so I said, like the, the translating uh, is not. The no, best no, no. Way. It has to come. You, you, you need to go through that process at the beginning of your journey, uh, language yeah. learning. Yeah, yeah, you have to go through that process. But I'm talking about when you reach that intermediate level, and then you. I'm not talking about beginner students. Yeah, yeah sure, it. sure. But yeah. I'm, we're we're now we're not even talking about students here. We're talking about the cultural differences and the words and words not really having a, a direct kind of a meaning. So like, even the word culture can be perceived differently by people of different cultures. Like in English, it could also mean like madaniyatli, right? A person of high culture, or like something like that. Like it's it's a different it's a different meaning, right? So, yeah, they they actually say culture is the most difficult word in English to define. Um, so yeah. All right. So going back a little bit to our conversation, so we talk about the you mentioned about sitcoms, right? So Seinfeld. I, yeah. yeah. So I want to hear your favorite sitcoms if you watch them sitcoms no never had the favorite one never i don't know why um i, I feel like w- w- when i was in russia there was this interne if i'm not mistaken on yeah. Tente, and they had also uh, i used to watch everybody probably people are going to hate me for this if there are russian people watching there was papi and dochki i liked it <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, one, it's one of those yeah it's one of those no How it's one of those english? shows uh, you never watched english it. okay so english The first, I'll tell you about the first one that I watched and I couldn't understand, but I've never learned the language uh, by watching movies or uh, TV shows. It was vice versa. I learned the language and then started watching TV shows in English. Uh, The first one, what was the first one I watched in English? Uh, I remember the time, it was after I got an eight, I decided to watch everything in English. Let's let's do it. Uh, It was Muhammad Ali just like the day before quarantine. He talked about... Uh, COVID-19 and Joe Rogan saying something about it and was and I was like you know this man watches Joe Rogan he understands it I, I also need to like, do it and that that was the first step I made it was first podcasts videos interviews in English and then I don't remember L- let me let me just um, I think it's the generational gap I think is it youngsters you? now so do, you, do you watch sitcoms do you have a favorite one or do you you don't agree I mean it doesn't really help it does uh, well If I were to pick three TV shows, um, American TV shows, obviously, and watch them for the rest of my life, uh, (laughs) 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 Uh, number one would probably be Suits. It's it's an American TV show about a bunch of lawyers, corporate lawyers, and uh, believe it or not, I watched this TV show on repeat about nine times. There are nine seasons each with probably 13 episodes, and the first two times, I would uh, be watching the show, and on my other screen, I'd have my dictionary and look up every single phrase, every single expression. So it was no fun, and but I really liked their interactions and they just you know smart talk, uh, just the lawyer life. And they get to live in uptown Manhattan, and they go and save big companies, 
like superheroes. So yeah, I just, just just the language point. It, like it, uh, Suits is not a sitcom, so to speak. No, it's a it's more a TV, a TV show. show. It's it's drama. A TV yeah, show. dramas. Yeah. But yeah, but, but yeah. Anyways, go ahead. The point ahead. is, yeah. it's a TV show. Something interesting to watch and could yeah. be. Uh, no, 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 Suits. suits. It's the, the you never seen Harvey Specter. Yeah. Harvey. Oh, right. So second one. Is it like a Hell's Kitchen? No, it's it's about lawyers. It's about lawyers. It's basically. TV show. Just a TV Have you have you seen Billions? I was recently introduced to okay, Billy. We'll, have you seen we'll come to you. No. So, so, <laughs> so, okay, yeah. Suits, number one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I kind of lost my point. <laughs> so you sure. have the three so, shows. Yeah, three topics. One is, yeah. Number one is Suits. So basically I'd be, you know, watching the uh, show and looking up the words and expressions uh, at the same time. And so the first two times I watched the show, it was no fun because I didn't really get the uh, jokes, their jargon. But the third, the fourth, the fifth time, it was a whole different experience. So I really started to get a kick out of the show. Uh, so my number two pick would probably be Ozarks. It's Ozarks. Yeah, it's Ozarks. About, it's, uh, it's a Netflix show. It's on Netflix, yeah. It's and, on Netflix. But there's age restrictions. So if there are kids watching this, you can't is it 18 watch it plus? until you turn. Yeah, well, there is some violence and explicit content. So it's about basically Mexican cartel and a guy who launders money for them. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's pretty intense this show so i don't recommend watching it unless uh, you someone understand understands financial terms and and the reason why i like this i like that this show is because it, it's about a guy who is the literal definition of relentless he goes through hell to save his family and i could kind of relate with that so i kept i couldn't help watching it over and over again so and the third one would, would probably be, um, yeah, GOT, Game of Thrones. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, th- this is also adult content, content, but there's a lot of politics and uh, smart talk. And so, yeah, I, these would be my three choices. Mamoru, so you don't watch any TV shows? Uh, she she mentioned Seinfeld. I, well, I, I used to. Um, well, I, I was introduced to Seinfeld um, through, I guess, his stand-up comedy, yeah. Jerry Seinfeld's comedy. Mm-hmm. But um, it's just something I used to watch before, but um, just like you said, the more I watched it over and over, the more meaning I got from it, the more I understood it better. But nowadays I don't watch it because I've, I've over-watched it. It's not that funny anymore <laughs> when I watch it. You, so you, you memorize the whole the yeah, show like and the, the lines, the all the lines, lines yeah. yeah. And for any situation in daily life, I can come up with a quote from Seinfeld. Hey, we should we should <laughs> probably talk level. more. We should probably talk more. <laughs> Who's your favorite character on on Seinfeld? Um, Kramer. George. Mm-hmm. I would say George. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. George. But he oh, well, he yeah like he he brought up like he basically listed all the shows that are not actually sitcoms or situational comedy. Yeah. When we talk about language learning, it's it's more more about you you learn. Language through com- comedy, like situational com- sitcoms. But when it comes to TV shows, I think the greatest show in TV history has to be Breaking Bad. No doubt. Breaking Bad is the no number doubt. one show. Except, this is. Except, Except the first episode, episode. maybe the okay. opening <laughs> scene. But no. <laughs> but if you get past that, it is the greatest show, hence that. That's down. what I stopped, by the way, yeah. The first <laughs> Breaking Bad. Like if you haven't seen Breaking Bad, then. On my what shorts. are you doing here? Uh, I YouTube shorts. I you forgot. You forgot. I, about I it? forgot. I left that one. I like. I kind of felt for a second bad about not mentioning Breaking Bad. No, I like. I was like <laughs> hoping mind, that you you wouldn't mention. It. It was like yeah. okay, all right, Breaking that, Bad. But, yeah. Can I change my those three picks? Yeah. Now take yeah. down the third. <laughs> which one? Which one are you taking out? Uh, the third one. Obviously the third one. Yeah. Or right, how about the books? Okay. Let's have uh, a. Uh, be, is there any books? Move on to the next question. A really important takeaway here. So if you guys are watching this, like what we this. This point we're all making here is, uh, apart from you know watching English content, it's really important that you do repetition. Yeah. So if you, you heard her say that she watched that TV sitcom, TV show several times until she finally could get it, uh, so did I. Yeah. Same experience here. Uh, rather than hop from one TV show to another, uh, you might want to pick one and watch it over and over again, no matter how absurd and crazy it sounds. So. What happens is all, all those lines and you know dialogues and vocabulary gets literally stuck in your mind. And once you start internalize uh, the language, then that's when mission is accomplished. I enjoyed watching the Guy Ritchie's movies in original language in English. 
Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie. Yeah. Guy Ritchie. Oh, oh, Guy Ritchie. Is that, he, he, he's a is director, he an actor? and yeah, he's oh, a okay. director. And uh, sounds recent, familiar. Recent one, I think, most uh, favorite, not favorite, and most uh, oh, let's popular talk about one favorite. is uh, Gentleman's, I guess. Everyone was Gentleman. Gentleman's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. Um, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, 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 exactly. Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, great actor. Great, uh, great and anyway, it's a g- there is a good English, I mean British English. I like the British English. Yeah, there is a lot of Irish. Yeah, you do. Yeah, Irish as well. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very funny. Anyway, so how about the books? Reading uh, the books. Let, let's give some practical advices to the students. So uh, we have a list of TV shows. Now we have any books? books. Let's make it three books then, okay? Uh, I have absolutely no idea what to advise, guys. But, I mean, everybody's interest is different. But if I have uh, coming from my own experience, the books that I really liked, uh, I'll try to relate it to your like IELTS journey and English language learning journey. I'd say oh, you can start with, uh, we in Bukhara start with stories, yeah, like Frankenstein, like so, what was that, uh, Phantom Opera or something? House? Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're really good ones. If, if anybody who's watching, uh, I mean, you want to help somebody, you can recommend them, read those. Yeah, but but, really but don't ones. listen to the audio tracks because they're so creepy. Oh, <laughs> 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 they're a lot of fun to listen to, by the way, like but a lot of fun. But books, I, I ha- um, um, I don't want to like admit, but something I have to, to read. Not I the haven't, books. Yeah, yeah ha- haven't read many books. I've, I've read, read uh, like uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Twelve Rules for Life. Uh, in, in case you want to, you know, uh, you are like in that what you call identity crisis. And yeah, stuff. going yeah. through yeah. midlife yeah. crisis, you can quarter life crisis. Yeah, you can you can read that Jordan Peterson. Yeah, and help me a lot from cover to cover. Did you, uh, did, not did you from cover to cover, no, 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 the no, no. Uh, w- w- that, the first rule about the uh, lobsters. I made it, I made it halfway, uh, so half the other half to finish. Yeah, I, I, I read the first chapter. It, it made it very clear, you know, like be confident and stuff. The second book that I read and I really liked, it was uh, White Fang by Jack London. White Fang, if I'm not mistaken, about like a wolf. Uh, r- it's just interesting story with really good plot and development that i liked it and the third one uh, would not be harry potter i don't know because everybody when i ask questions what's your favorite book it's harry potter harry potter yeah everybody i think had this the third book might be uh that i've read in english and liked uh, was a very practical one it's called everybody lies uh, i think i will give it to muhammad ali today I, it's a Thanks. really good one. it's a, it's about uh, it's written by Seth, uh, I forgot, David Seth Davidovitz or something like that. He's a Jewish uh, guy who, um, he worked in Google company and he uh, studied statistics. He he was working in the data marketing something. Data department. science? Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. yeah, he was literally had access to all the searches on Google. Yeah, and he made uh, advertisements and marketing oh, they, stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah they, they say... You you actually said something along those lines. Like I'm sorry about that, but we'll we'll everybody we'll say, lies. Everybody lies. Yeah. So you you said like the only person that you know you best is yourself, and then I have to make the point that actually nowadays it's Google that knows no, everyone better than yourself. Like right. So and then the the, 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 the this the, this is related to data science that that yeah, you brought have up. You yeah. read the book? I, I I've heard about the book. I know the concept. So that yeah 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 but the, that it's really good book for anybody uh, just trying to you know uh, do a little a little bit self development because it teaches you uh, about uh, the things that uh, big data uh, can change in your life yeah that big data is everything so basically they they know whatever like you like whatever you do they know everything like just everything it's crazy. everything about you yeah, yeah yeah it's crazy I about books I. Probably you're going to say about something sign related to science. <laughs> I've been reading so many books. I love reading books, but it's just a matter of finding time for them these days. Um, but I would really recommend um, the books that I've read are mostly Shakespeare books. I used to read a lot of Shakespeare. One, because it was a requirement in school. Yeah. And two, Is because once you get into the system. That, no, that's the high school requirement. Yeah, King, yeah. King Lear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Beth, we used to read a lot of you know, Shakespeare books and a lot of books by Homer. This is Greek uh, mm, blind Homer. Uh, yeah. poet. And we read the Iliad, the Odyssey. And those are just really high level English. Like even United States students, they don't understand most of the time. It's not, even if you're, not, it, if you're gonna read on your, in your own language, you will not understand yeah, them yeah, anyway. Yeah. It's, it's if you read Navoi, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really high uh, 
literature and I think the reason they made us read them, I think it was in ninth grade. That's why I said in ninth and tenth grade, I realized that I was at a you know good, <laughs> good level because I survived those <laughs> yeah. books. If you, could read, if you could read those books and understand, it's like, yeah, yeah. At the time, I didn't because at no. the time we had we did discussions in class and everybody had to say one point and I was always the last one to give a point after everybody said something because I would wait until everybody says something and I would understand it better and then I would say my point. But those books. My point is to read books that are challenging to you, not at your level, but maybe one step higher than your level, because then you're really, you know, pushing your comfort zone with reading and you're learning something new, and especially uh, with language. Those books had really interesting sentence structures, <laughs> and you can't replicate them. And we did a lot of assignments where we had to write stories that were in that style. Like we we learned a poet or an author about one of their works, and then we used to create something just like that. So we learned different kinds of poetry, we, we learned like haikus, we used to write haikus, different poetry. But um, I really recommend Shakespeare books, and also um, books that are, like you said, self-motivational, like motivational books, and I really enjoy reading um, Brian Tracy's books, Brian Tracy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that Tracy. guy. He's, a, mm. that he's a trainer, yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a business coach, yeah. a motivational speaker. He's also a business person. He's very famous. Yeah, he's, he's I, eat that to, to me, he's a scam, but yeah, okay. Well, yeah. it's a different conversation. <laughs> well, yeah. Maybe, yeah. but yeah. I, I take away the good stuff from it. Like, no, it, no, 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 you book. should. You, you definitely should. Should, like, uh, the same with uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yeah. Robert Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki, yeah. his book... Um, I just read it because everybody was else was reading yeah, at exactly, the same time, yeah, and yeah. I attended one of his events. Actually, he had a workshop. He didn't him, he himself didn't come, but um, his <laughs> friends came. So I thought I would go meet him. So we went with my husband, but they just did a lot of talk about you know rich dad poor poor dad the the concepts that were in that uh, book, and then they had a um, it was like a webinar. They yeah, actually yeah, presented yeah. something, and then they tried to sell the course. But we just went there for the speech to see if we can meet Robert Kiyosaki, but he wasn't there. But any books that will help you to um, that will help you to enjoy reading, not because you have to f to learn something, but just just for the fun of it, like you said, enjoy the process. Any book that you like, um, I myself enjoy, like you said, Shakespeare books like um, Little Women. You know, they have a Little they woman. have a yeah, yeah, they yeah, have yeah. a movie, but I I've never read the book before, but I mean to one of these days when I have time, and. To be honest, with IELTS, after nine, I've been so busy. I don't have time for my kids. So when I read something, I feel so guilty. You know, <laughs> I can spend this time with my kids. But um, yeah, anything that will help you to read for fun. Your questions? Uh, when it comes to, to be honest, um, books or recommending books, I actually have a different insight. Um, I feel like don't listen to anybody or don't, don't give in to anyone's list of so-called best books to read it's um books are just like people you know in my understanding books are just like people you have to meet them yourself you have they these books have to come across in your in, in certain parts of your life like it's not like you sh you shouldn't read a book just because someone else is reading it like for example uh, we um, people are really obsessed about like Obama's top ten book recommendations or Bill Gates' top ten. Yeah. The, the, they they are reading those books because they're there. You know, like the level. Obama is there to read. You know, to read yeah. and understand and analyze those. But maybe right? Oh, those books speak to Obama because he's there. Like you, your takeaway from the the same book would not might not be as you know good as yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so when it comes to recommending books I'm like you know read anything that comes your way read anything that that you you know come across not not just because someone recommends books and plus Naturally. books to me are like are an intimate uh, subject like the books that you read should be really something that you discuss maybe with yourself or someone with, with a very close friend, maybe. Uh, like you shouldn't really talk publicly about, oh, I read this book, that book. It's like, so like you're reading those books for yourself, like who cares, right? So, but I do love reading a lot of books. I, I love buy. I actually love buying more books than I read, but <laughs> but I do I do read them as well. But um, yeah. So when it comes to reading books and recommending books, like my thing is like I just read the books that you 
come across that come your way and, and then you'll have fun with it yeah that's a good point like obama is at that space he's at in that point in his life where those books are important speak to, to them him, yeah right yeah they they resonate with those books whatever is written in those books and if i recommend let's say sh- read shakespeare and you say okay i'm gonna get a nine let me read shakespeare you have to you know let things come to you exactly don't chase somebody else's books because they've been through steps that led them to that book and that book mattered to them at that time and it was the necessary book for them at the time like I, I read those books because they came naturally to me in my classes like I can't recommend somebody to go and read Iliad because they're gonna think it's stupid that this is not English right it's mm-hmm. it's really mm-hmm. different it's really crazy you know yeah. Iliad and Odyssey there's an IELTS reading on that, actually. Oh, on really? that, Yeah, there's an IELTS. So before I ask you the last question, because it has been a while since, if we're going to sit, we're just going to continue to talk yeah. about it. So your list. Oh, do you advise reading or not? So uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, reading has been life-changing for me. But before I talk about my personal favorites, I'd like to follow up on what Ms. Mamura just said. You just have to watch and read what you love. Yeah, and just let it come natural she said so as for my favorites uh, so n- top of my list would probably be uh, outwitting the devil by napoleon hill but it's a really heavy one so uh, th- there's a lot of abstract concepts there about you know the way the world works and everything so yeah and, and i feel like you have to be of certain age to understand this book uh, and in fact i've uh, barely read like a quarter of this book and I'm still processing and I, I don't think I can go back to reading this book so and the second one would probably be again by Napoleon Hill Think and Grow Rich yeah Think and Grow Rich yeah, it's the one the, that I read too I read that yeah. before too uh, there, yeah there are also a lot of useful points about uh, how to become successful in life and, the, I, and I feel like these two books have uh, they try to explain the same co- concept they are they have the same theme which is law uh, of attraction yeah, yeah. and never accept defeat yeah and the third one was probably the one i read i've been reading for some time now is good to great about how to build a good company how to build a great company so it basically uh, talks about different companies that went from being mediocre to exceptional ones and what made them stand out from all other companies who were in the same business and industry so what i'm what i've lately been trying to do is uh, really take the, all those concepts and implement them. Uh, implement them. So, yeah. My so first book in English mind. was actually, don't laugh, was Man in Black. I took it from the British Council Library. I remember it was like a yeah. thin book. It was <laughs> the <laughs> thinnest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man do, in do Black. you remember the books? They just yeah, 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 yeah. books yeah, yeah. from no, those different like, movies. Is this the movie? Man yeah. in Black? Yeah. With yeah. Sam, Sam yeah. Smith or what was his name? Will Smith. Will Smith. Will Smith. Will Smith. So, uh, like 20 years ago, I guess, yeah. more than 20 mm-hmm. years ago, British Council had the uh, libraries all over yeah. the country. Good, I mean, good old days. Good old days. Yeah. So, if you go there, there used to be the books of movies. Mm-hmm. So, Men in Black. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was like, yeah. Probably aimed at those like language learners yeah, at language different levels. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, that, my first book in English was actually The Men in Black. Men in <laughs> Black. Okay. Men in Black. All right. So, I'm, I, I'm actually going to go out of my way and maybe talk about the, the list because I hear th- these are the greatest, like some of the greatest books that she, everyone is mentioning. I, I, you know, I'm familiar with some of the Shakespeare books or works of Shakespeare, but I haven't really read them like completely. Uh, I'm not sure he mentioned what, what books did you Everybody mention? Everybody lies. Everybody lies. Yeah, I, I understand. I'm familiar with the concept. I haven't read the book again, but Napoleon Hill. I'm really big fan of Napoleon Hill. I think uh, I think he's the father of this uh, self development yeah. authors. Uh, it goes back to the 30s. Um, but now I actually want to give a list because I feel like reading fiction books have been some sort of a uh, they, 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 they have we we've so there was a I think there has been a decline in the popularity of fiction books for some yeah, reason. For, I don't know for what reason for I don't, yeah because, because of the self, self-help, self-help books popular, yeah like yeah. everyone is reading self-help, self-help books yeah. like my, my first, first book, book that, that's in Uzbek I read it when I was twelve Ikke Ishigarase like it's the best I think the name book, Ikke Ishigarase by Utkar Hoshimov. Uh-huh. Like to me, that's the best Uzbek like liters lit- in the back, best in the Uzbek literature. Uh, another one could be um, in English. It would be um, Catcher in the Rye. Not sure if you're. I, I think it, it's in this high school program, Catcher in the Rye. 
Uh, oh, so, Catch and Drive. My sister read it. Yeah, so it's, it is, I think it's one of those, the, it's the most controversial books of all time, Catcher in the Rye. I like, saw it in the movie. Like they, 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 I think it, Brad Pitt was like holding it in the movie, reading it. Oh, yeah, it's the, like, it's the book that, that, that's uh, most discussed and debated, um, Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, and I forgot the third one, but um, yeah. Alchemist. Alchemist is probably another one that I would highly recommend. Again, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't really recommend, but Alchemist is the one that spoke to me at a certain age. Catcher in the Rye took me by surprise. Not, not like I was mind, like mind blown. Uh, Utkar Hashimov, like, uh, he's, he's the best. He's the best. One more book, like, uh, yeah, well, about Catcher in the Rye. It was uh, the book called uh, 1984. 1984, Orwell, very, Orwell, similar, George, very similar, very similar. Yeah, George Orwell. Yeah, like, yeah. amazing book, like, great, opens, like, you know, very eye-opening. So, the last, last question, question yeah. which I really want to. So, uh, every time when I have a guest, we usually we ask the question, uh, I ask about who influenced you, who was, the, like, about turning point, what we discussed earlier. So, I want to hear the story where you have influenced the other people have you changed the other people's life do you have someone in your life you can remember telling them that this is why i've done it or probably by teaching them english teaching them ielts or anything else can you share that experience can you tell us a bit yeah, yeah. who wants to start i don't know I think Muhammad Ali can uh, speak about me. I'd say, again, he said that. <laughs> pick I, me, pick I, me. I, yeah, I, I also don't really like idolizing, you know, uh, what you call, I think fanatism is on the rise right now in Uzbekistan. Well, because after I got nine, some of the guys in my comment section, when I answered them, you know what, they res what the first response is that you made my day. And nine that responded to my message. I'm like, come yes. on, man. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm a man like you, you know, and. Uh, yeah, again, I uh, just don't want to idolize er anyone, but I'd say uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, yeah, not, not the boxer, no, the, the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I learned a lot from uh, Muhammad Ali. I changed the way I teach. I observed some of his classes. I liked them. There, there's a lot more, of course, depth in you than just, you know, you being a teacher. Uh, and I've learned a lot from me, yeah. So yeah, I'm really uh, you glad. can talk about, oh, yeah, you can talk about me. Yeah, I, I changed the way I teach uh, and I changed the way I do some of the things in my general life. Like so, I, sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Are we talking about our memorable, successful stories? Mentors? Have you, you, influenced you influenced other people? Okay. You influenced You influenced other people. Well, there, a, Can you share any interesting story about it? A laundry list of uh, people I could talk about, but uh, all right. So uh, why don't I instead talk, uh, instead talk about the general concept I use when mentoring people? So uh, I think the problem with a lot of the young people these days, they they and it's just not young people sometimes it's often the case with adults sometimes it's the ca case with adults as well it's fear and having low ambitions so i think my job as a mentor is to help them to overcome that barrier and uh, well so the way i do it is and it, it's probably going to sound a little controversial but uh, what i tell them is they what we are doing in the classroom is not just learning a foreign language we are literally saving the universe and here's my explanation to that. What I tell them is uh, each and every single one of us, there is a part of universe in us. So like every decision we make and every word we say uh, has a rippling effect. So well, what I tell them is, is no matter how insignificant and small they think, their actions, their, their, their decisions in life and, and what they choose to do with their life can have profound impact not just on their own life, but the lives of many other people. So uh, what I'm trying to do is, this, this is the concept I usually use in the classroom, is tell them that uh, they're important, but at the same time teach them how to control that. So, Just one story, uh -huh. one example. Okay, we so, don't need really names. So no names, then uh, there's actually one instance. So a student, we were having a class, it's just a regular day, regular Tuesday, and uh, she looked all, uh, you know, uh, beat up and uh, stressed out, and she was really anxious. And you now, and it's completely typical of a teenager. And uh, 
and she and, and I asked her what her ambitions were, like what she wanted to do, and all she had to do, all she had to say was, I'm just going to get IELTS and probably go to one of the local universities because that's what my parents want me to do. And, and then I started asking her about long-term goals and dreams, and she talked about all the things she wants to do with her life. And, and kids are actually, they're so imaginative, and they, they're, they, they're, they, they have big goals and dreams. It's just they have some limiting beliefs, so to speak. And uh, so, and I remember uh, telling her exactly what I just said, that she wasn't just some girl. She had some universe and her part of the universe and that we, we're like carbon-based creatures uh, beings and carbon is something made in the stars so you could say that there, we are made of stardust so it, it kind of rhymes with our logo here and uh, you know school <laughs> motto to the stars so and and that was i think sort of served as a paradigm shift in her thinking and two three months later she is a changed girl I want to go last, if if I may. It's okay. Yeah, I want to go last, so you can ask. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of mentors myself. I don't know if I changed anybody's, but um, your kids. Well, 100%. yes, of course, my kids. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of things you have to do differently when you have kids. <laughs> you know, yeah. you have to think what you say. You have to think about what you do before you do. But um, number one thing that I try to teach my kids that I try to. Um, you know, instill in them the value is to be honest, not just with everybody else, just with yourself too. Like if, if you're not, if you're struggling with something, admit it and, you know, seek help. Because I see a lot of instances, and this is a problem in the United States too, there's a lot of mental health issues. And I think that's why we have a lot of self-help books about <laughs> that are going <laughs> That's, that's one of the reasons why they are gaining popularity. Yeah, so a lot of students, um, and I don't know why this is the case in the United States, but mental health is such an important thing it, it starts you know when you're young it starts with your parents how mentally healthy you are as an adult right so if if you are shown the right way or if you're guided in the right direction with the right words with the right um, you know reinforcement positive reinforcement and the right encouragement then I think you're gonna become a pretty healthy adult you know when you're older but if you go through some trauma and you don't know how to deal with it and if it's still an issue with you today then something happened along those lines where you couldn't you know put two and two together and you still have that connection lost so i try to teach my kids to be honest so if they're feeling something like they don't they can't do something then come to me or come to daddy or ask somebody for help and like seek out help you know like that ego thing don't have this belief that you're strong that you can do it yourself Yes, you, you will get to that level at some point, but before that, you need to learn from others. So with my students, I, I have a lot of students, they um, message me on Instagram. They say, uh, Miss Mamura, I want to do this, but my parents said I can't do this because there aren't many girls in this field, for example. I'm not going to name anybody, but they asked about uh, a certain field where it's mainly ma male-dominated field. Um, so I said, well, go for it. Why not? You know, there's always the first person to do something. It's not about um, what other people think you should do, right? Of course, to a certain degree where your parents know you, maybe know your weaknesses or strengths, and they say they can advise you, like, why don't you try doing this, right? Because they know your personality. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what you think you can do and what you are willing to do to get to there, to get to that point. So... If you, if somebody says you can't do something, like the way I do is when somebody tells me I can't do something, I, I go and do that <laughs> I and I prove them wrong. And just to show, not to them, but to myself that, you know, this is possible, it's something they can do. So same thing with IELTS, IELTS 9, what it gave me, the number one thing that it gave me was confidence in teaching my kids that go for what you want to do. You know, before, if I couldn't do it, if I just stopped at eight and a half or eight, then I can't tell my daughters to pursue your dreams, you know, to the end, till, until it makes you happy, until you can become the best person that you can be, till you reach your potential. If I don't do that myself, if I don't, uh, you know, show that in my own actions. So whatever I say has to align with what I do and what I teach. So that also reverberates in the classroom where I apply the same techniques that I do with my children to my students. So 
I guess it's a way of motivating them because my goal is to motivate them to not just pursue IELTS to get a high score, but to anything in life, especially for women, for girls. Because I have a lot of students that say, um, Miss Mamura, I have three kids. I'm also home. I haven't studied for English you know, in a long time. And I want to start again because you inspired me. I said, well, continue. You know, don't let me be your inspiration, but yourself. You know, your story is your own inspiration. Follow that, and you know, see what you can do. There's nothing stopping you except yourself, right? Your beliefs. Jahangir, anything else to add? I'm afraid I might not have anybody in mind in particular whom I have personally like influenced and like to change the tra the trajectory of their life. <clears throat> I there is a person I hope. I positively influenced. Uh, it's my future wife. I, I hope, it, again, I hope, because every time we talk, um, the, I think whenever there is like, a, that the, there are dark times, you know, that there are problems, ups and downs, and when it happens, she usually says that I am that beam of light that uh, she desperately needed, and the same goes for me. She is the beam of light that I desperately needed. Yeah, she, she was like a former student of mine. Uh, you know, I had a lot of time uh, studying her personality, what she likes, what she doesn't like, how she's, she, she works, how she doesn't work, and she was the most diligent student I had out of all of the students I've had. And all the, let's say, she's very, would you say that, um, I like the, the her work ethics as well as um, the, yeah, the work ethics. She she has it, and she always says that you have to be honest, no matter what, no matter how, no matter when. You have to be honest with everything. That's the only path to take. So yeah, I I hope that I have positively influenced her life and changed it for the better. Yeah, yeah that's your great. turn. Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I I actually don't want to talk about it that much um, because. So I'm just going to quote a song, maybe. And I feel like, again, goes back to our discussion of how uh, IELTS obsession, whether for the better or worse, came into existence in Uzbekistan. Like uh, how people are really crazy about IELTS, taking the IELTS exam or uh, trying to get nine. Now it's, you know, it's been this way for so many years that we forget. So I really don't, <laughs> don't want to talk about this that much, but... Uh, I'm into raps, you know, like the the gangster rap or the, this <laughs> song. So I, I really love, this is something that I, I think I, again, this is a generational thing. I grew up Eminem. with Eminem. I grew Eminem. up with Eminem, I yeah. Which song you're talking the about. The GOAT, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, 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 no. <laughs> I actually want to talk about someone else. Uh, I actually want to quote someone else. It's uh, Nas. Uh, it's Nas another Daily? rapper. So, n are, you, are you into rap or yeah, no? Exactly. Yeah, okay. I heard about Nas the guy. Ether. Uh, that's the song Ether. Uh, uh, it was a this song targeted at Jay Z. Uh, there's a line in the song that I think I closely identify with. In a way, again, I feel I take pride in this. Um, in, in in a way that I have s uh, maybe to some extent inspired others to challenge themselves to go the extra mile. So the Nas in his song Ether says, name a rapper that I, I ain't influenced. Like, name a rapper that I haven't influenced. So that's, that's pretty much the line that I think. <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a mic that's drop. That's it. <laughs> that was a mic drop. Yeah, it was. No, 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 no. It, yeah, it was. The point, if, if, I, if, yeah, if. But again, this is something that I feel like, yeah. And it's not targeted at anybody. It's like, it's the industry. It's the competition, the competitive spirit. It's the, um, it's what we have now, like the, in the IELTS field. And I don't really think it's a positive thing, to be honest. Well, I'll take it from, That's, I mean, my understanding of that will be a little bit different. You just need to be a person who you are and live your life as it is and be an example to other people instead of chasing, instead of trying to do or prove to someone else. Just be honest man, be the right man and do the yeah, right things. Exactly, That's yeah. it. And I think uh, honesty. 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 I, I, honesty is the uh, most important things in the life because without honesty, without trust, I think there is nothing you can build yeah. I mean, in your life. Anyway, so guys, gentlemen and ladies, thank you very much for coming today. It was very interesting. The thing is, uh, you know, when we started this project, to be honest, I didn't see much potential about 
this conversation and everything. But now I start enjoying it. You know why? Because <laughs> I have an opportunity to speak with the different intelligent people who actually has got a lot of things to share. Like with other people, like wise. Yeah. Like wise. with other people, and when I see that the w where the, all these people at the same level, or let's say at certain uh, s uh, level, we think the same way, we share the common values. I really, really like that. The something different, something good can happen in the future, anyway. So thank you very much for all of you being. Uh, good teachers being the good people being the influencer being the people who motivate the other people anyway so thank you very much uh, before we wrap up uh, just one more time thank you to akmalika for arranging organizing bringing us all of all of us together because some of us you know come a long way from different place that's um, that that's a double thank you yeah, <laughs> yeah. A huge this, this is like a marvel dc crossover yeah, yeah when you bring characters <laughs> from different universes yeah this is for things you. like i'm like actually thank you for sure that to mm. be honest, yeah. because the Sherzot is the one who actually uh, coordinate this kind of events. So thank you very much, Sherzot, for you, for your effort, for your time, and two, he two always weeks, pushes yeah. everyone. Two, two weeks ago, actually, I came here for I don't know for a random reason, and that's how he he actually asked for my opinion whether it was a good idea to do this, and I like yeah, why not? It's uh, it's great to, but uh, yeah, that was that turned out to be really. Great, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Thank, thank you, you guys. I also want to mm -hmm. thank you for organizing this and for Sherzat, for IDP. And, um, you know, it's. I just hope this, I got a lot of inspiration from all of you, from your stories, from how you achieved, you know, what you've achieved. And you've all come a long way. It's very inspiration, inspirational for me. And I hope this will inspire other students too. So no matter where you are in your life, whatever you want to do, like whether it's fitness or whether to overcome obstacles, you know, to, you know, going through whatever. You can do it. You know, you you need to come out from the other side stronger. Not be in competition with others, but be with yourself, with your old self. Like every day is a fresh start, right? So, thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. I think next next step is going to be when we're gonna create kind of uh, community or. Uh, association of the teachers I, or something I, like that, I, where we actually, nine? yeah, not oh, band, band nine, nine. teachers, oh, okay. not just only teachers. band nine, just, just teachers, oh, okay. English teachers. I think there's there's, there's enough, enough people, people now to yeah, I guess establish so. a community. <laughs> yeah. I once did it with 8.5 holders back in the day when there were very few of them. Yeah. There, now we actually have a group uh, that has been dead for so, so long time. Like. Um, we, we, why not, you know, yeah. start a band nine? Be the next <laughs> <stage>. <laughs> anyway. We can. Okay. All right. Thank you one more time. All right. Yeah, Everybody. Everybody.